Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not. I made a video like this several times and even recently on TikTok about my family relation to the Colonel and how there are no other Sanders in the family. Now, I can say that with confidence, not for bragging rights or because I want to be the last one, but because I am the last one. There have been countless people, including before I was born, when my grandfather worked in uh, Fairfield. He worked with somebody with the last name of Sanders, too. And this guy was bragging about knowing the colonel and bragging about being related to him. And he wasn't related to him. My grandfather ended up calling him out. He said, it's funny, I've never seen you at any of our family reunions. Even in recent days, I get people with the last name Sanders on my TikTok page constantly saying that they're related or they're messaging me saying that they are related. And then they show me their family tree and they A, show me a tree that's inaccurate or B, refuse to show me a tree. They say, oh, I don't have a tree, but we just trust us that we have it. No. Okay. No. See, I know the Sanders line to me. You have Clarence Sanders, who was the Colonel's brother. You have the Colonel and you have his sister, Catherine. Catherine Last name changed to Cummings, and that's where you get Lee Cummings and Violet Lou Cummings, and then those names have branched off to many different ones. You have Bennett, you have Edwards, and there's still some Cummings around today. No Sanders on Catherine's side. They're related, but no last name Sanders. On the Colonel's side, him and Josephine had a son, Harlan David Sanders Jr., who died in his 20s from um, a blood infection. And he died young without children. He only had two surviving daughters, Margaret and Mildred. Margaret married, and her name changed to Adams, and her children were Adams. They're still Adams today. Mildred married someone named Ruggles. Her last name changed to Ruggles. Her children were Ruggles. And there's other last names associated too, but none of them are Sanders. And some people come forward to me on my page, and they say, I'm a Sanders, I'm the Colonel's grandson. I'm like, no, you're not. The grandchildren don't have my last name. Or they come to me and they say, I'm a Sanders, I'm the colonel's nephew. And I say, no, you're not. I know all the nephews alive today. Today, nephews, greats, great greats, and great great greats that are alive. Myself, my grandfather, my uncle, and my father. Those four. Then you have my sister and my other sister who are nieces. And you have my aunt who's a niece. And her two children who are two nieces. But there's only four males in the Sanders family with the Sanders last name living today. Prior to that, we had Charles Sanders, who was my grandfather's father. Charles was the nephew of the colonel on the Sanders side. He was Clarence Sanders' son. Clarence had two children. He had Charles Sanders and Jim Sanders, or James Sanders. We called him Uncle Jim. Uncle Jim owned a Columbus, Indiana franchise dressed just like the Colonel and even replaced him in the advertisements for a short time before he was fired. He mouthed off to the brand or to someone in corporation and they fired him from being the spokesperson of the brand. He then sold his franchise in Columbus, Indiana and retired. He lived in Seymour, Indiana. Jim didn't have any biological children of his own and his stepson didn't carry the last name Sanders. And unfortunately, his stepson is dead now. And I don't believe he had any kids. Charles had one son and three daughters. One daughter is alive today, the other two are dead, and they have children alive today. But guess what? Their last names aren't Sanders. So when someone comes to me and they say that their last name's Sanders and that they're related to me or the colonel, as a nephew, niece, or grandchild, they're lying or they've been lied to. I've seen countless family trees online that were made by extended family or people not related at all, just trying to put a tree together, and they're completely inaccurate. Some of them have Violet Lou Cummings as Lee Cummings' mother and the Colonel's sister, and Catherine Sanders' sister. But Violet Lou was Catherine's daughter and Lee's sister. That right there shows me a lot of trees that have Violet Lou as the Colonel's sister are inaccurate. They also don't contain all the family alive today or all the family that was alive. Not everybody around the world knows the entire family. I didn't really want to put my whole family on the internet, but when the position that I am in now and people are trying to come forward for some clout, 
I, I don't like rumors. I don't like lies. I don't like people lying. So I set them straight. There are no other Sanders. If there is another Sanders out there, they are from the Colonel's grandfather siblings or the Colonel's father siblings, which all the DNA testing that we have done, and we didn't do it to see if we're related to the Colonel. My aunt loves doing genealogy. She doesn't make a big deal about the relation to the Colonel. She just likes genealogy. And she likes to figure out where she's from, who she's related to. She knows thousands of people on those websites related. Not one of them have the Sanders last name. Now, she says it's possible that there could be one that's unknown, that's not in the systems, and doesn't even know themselves whether they're related. It could be. But from all the DNA testing that we've done, all the information that is available, both the public trees, the ones that we can verify, and the ones that we have privately that are 100% accurate that we don't want anybody tampering with, do not show any other Sanders. The last distant Sanders cousin of mine that lived was in 1997. This is when he died was Howard Sanders, who was John Alexander Sanders' son. John Alexander Sanders was Wilbur Sanders' brother, who was the colonel's uncle on the Sanders side. And when you go way back, because the furthest back on the Sanders side that we could trace is to New Jersey and our last name changed to Saunders with a U. At some point between the 1700s, somewhere in the 1700s, our last name changed from Saunders to Sanders. I don't know if that was just a name change that was made. I don't know if that was a marriage that changed the name. I don't know. It doesn't show. We don't have any ancestral records for the Sanders before that. So it's possible there's Saunders related to us. There's other people related to us with different last names that we don't know about. It's possible, but they wouldn't know that they're related either. And most of these people that have come forward to me claiming to be related, their biggest story is the colonel gave us the recipe. It's the biggest crock story I've heard a lot of people in this family say. There's one person in my family that may have the recipe. I have not seen it with my own eyes, but I could believe them because their father worked with it, supposedly knew it, which I believe he did. He helped mix the recipe alongside with Uncle Jim. Uncle Jim didn't have any kids and he died. He didn't hand it to anybody. Claudia helped mix the recipe. She didn't hand it out to anybody. We learned that when Joe Lettington leaked his fake recipe. He claimed it was it. It wasn't it. It wasn't the handwriting. It wasn't Claudia's or the Colonel's handwriting. And it had a lot of misspells in it. And it had inaccuracies in it as well. As salt they listed as one of the 11. But these people who would be distant cousins of mine saying that their last names are Sanders. Claim that the Colonel gave their family the recipe. Why would Uncle Harley give an extended distant cousin relative the recipe over his own daughters? Over his own nephews? Over his own sister? But it doesn't make sense to me why he would do that. And so I say he doesn't, he did not do that, period. He did not hand that recipe throughout the family. If anybody kept it, they went behind his back when they were helping mix it and just saved it. And if we have it today, anybody in the family has it today, you're not going to see them bragging about it. I only reveal what is already public, whether that's a fake recipe or accurate information. I reveal what is public so that we know what we have to work with. That way people could quit making stuff up and we could disprove these fake recipes. But as I'm saying this, there are no other Sanders in the family. Some people do their research. There are some accurate names that I recognize. And when people come to me and they say that they're related with my last name, the only way that I will show any interest in believing them is if they give me names that only I know of. But somebody of DJ Sanders did know a name. He spelt it wrong. It was Jaduthan Sanders, who was the colonel's grandfather's father. Jaduthan fathered Cyrus. Cyrus fathered Wilbur. Wilbur fathered the colonel. But he spelled Jaduthan wrong. That was my first, eh, when he spelled Jaduthan wrong. Turns out it was fake. He wasn't related. He gave me a couple other names that I didn't recognize. I went to my aunt. She went to the tree. There was no record of it. Jaduthan only had two children. He had a son and a daughter. And the daughter's last name changed to Murfin. 
His son's last name was Sanders, Cyrus Sanders. Cyrus Sanders had many children, several daughters, several sons. Most of his sons didn't have children of their own. The ones that did have children of their own married the name off. And then there's me. Wilbur had a son, Harlan Sanders. Harlan Sanders had a son who died with no kids. Harlan Sanders' brother, who Wilbur Sanders fathered, was Clarence. Clarence had a son. Clarence had two sons. One of his sons successfully had a son. That son had two sons. One of those sons had me. So you see, I know that I'm related. I know I am related. If there's a distant cousin out there, the, the only way they would know that they are related is if they've done the ancestry DNA testing to confirm that they are related. So if somebody comes forward with that, we will have a match on our records. I would recognize them. Boom, more Sanders. That would be great. I'd love not to be the last Sanders. But I, I just get so tired of people pretending for clout. I understand people do it. People do it. I don't know why, but they do it. I know they do, and they're always going to do it. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to disprove what I can. And if somebody with my last name comes forward and they are related, well, that's going to be a miracle. And I will welcome them in the family with open arms. But if you're an a-hole about it, or if you're not related and you're insisting that you are, but being an a-hole about it, I'm going to be an a-hole back. My TikTok has been full. I have a playlist called Family History and Confusion. And on that playlist... I repeat this same story over and over and over and over and over again, but it just gets lost. People don't look at the playlist. So I'm putting it on YouTube here just to, for it to make perfect sense so it could be as clear as possible. There are no other Sanders in the Colonel's family today. If you have any other last name and you say you're related to me, I will believe you because there are so many last names in this family. But if you come forward to me or you're online bragging about being a Sanders and related to the Colonel, I'm going to say something because you're going to either have to show me evidence that you are related to me or you're going to have to stop lying. And that's just how it is. I prefer people not to publicly do it in the comments because that's showing me that they want to get clout. You can send me a message on Instagram. You can send me a message somewhere else privately. You could join the discord and message me in my discord. And we can discuss it. I helped John Alexander's Sanders family know how they were related to the colonel. They knew Howard Sanders. They knew they were related, but they didn't know how. They had no DNA testing. They had no ancestral website uh, trees set up. They just knew from Howard the story, and no one ever believed them. I had ancestral trees set up. Howard is in the ancestral trees. His children aren't. But he is. When I talked to his grandchildren, we found photos that matched in my family's and theirs, and we connected the line, and now we have more extended family that we're happy to know. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I was hoping that Howard still had Sanders' kids, but he didn't. He had daughters, and they married names. Names change. And there's several stories like that if you go through the full family tree. Now, some people come to me with family trees that don't show me. They don't show Uncle Jim. They don't show other people in the Colonel's nephews because they're not all on those public trees. And they come to me with those and they call me a liar saying I'm not related. And I understand. I call a lot of people a liar because there's a lot of liars out there. People lying about having the recipe. People lying about being related. People lying about uh, really no knowing him. People lying on his name to get clout. I don't agree with doing that. If you knew the colonel, that's a great story. Share it. That's cool. No need to lie and exaggerate about it. So I guess what I'm saying here, I'm just trying to make it as clear as possible. There are no other Sanders in the colonel's family other than me, my sisters, and my grandfather, and my father and uncle. That are living. Especially on the nephew side. Now again. Distant cousin. You got to show me. How you're related. And we have to make it make sense. Because there are millions of Sanders across the world. That are not related. But they do have similar names in their family line. Those can get honestly confused. On ancestral trees. 
Someone else could have a Jaduthan Sanders in their family line. But because that name is highly associated with Colonel Sanders' family tree, somebody going through their family tree can see that it will pop up. Maybe they're born the same year. I've seen it. Maybe they're born and died the same year, same area. It just gets confused, and they honestly make a mistake and add them into their tree thinking that they're related, and that becomes a cool bragging right. And you start telling people about it, then I pop up and I ruin it, and I apologize for that. But if you're lying on his name knowingly for clout, I, I, I have no respect for you, and I'm going to call you a liar. But it's, it's just what it is. You know, we have a lot of family. The colonel has many grandchildren, great-grandchildren. The... Um, Catherine has many great grandchildren, grand uh, children, and grandchildren. Clarence in it doesn't have a very big family. In his direct line related to him, Clarence's side is dwindling away. But the Colonel's line won't end. There's a lot of grandchildren. The relation won't end. There's a lot of Dunleavys, Cleggs, Cathcarts, and uh, you name it. There's a lot. There's a lot of family and extended family out there. The colonel's bloodline is not going to end at me. The last name might, but it's just what it is. I mean, again, if another, if a distant cousin of mine comes forward and they're truthful about it, praise the Lord. I'll put them in the family tree. I will tell everybody that they are related I'll, if they want to be known. And I will, uh, I, I will accept that. And then it will change to there are no other Sanders other than me and these guys. But there are a lot of liars out there. The biggest one, if you know somebody with the last name Sanders and they're saying they're related, if they say they have the original recipe, they're lying. That, that's the biggest turnoff. They're lying if they say they have the original recipe because nobody has it. Again, one family that, member that's not the last name Sanders, different last name, might have it. They have a very good reason to have a very good story behind it. So I'm inclined to believe them. They're not sharing it. They're not going to post it. They're not going to flail it around. They're not going to brag about it. They're not going to share it with their friends. It's not going to get handed around the family. It's going to stay with them. And that's how it should be. If they have it. But there's a lot of other family... Extent, like Joe Lettington, I shouldn't say his family is not related and he decided to dig his own grave with this family, um, with his lies. But people like him bragging about having it and lying about it. If he was being truthful about what he was sharing, I would have no problem with people calling him the nephew. But people are calling him the colonel's own nephew. Some call him the only nephew. That's wrong. And the way that he's been lying and the things that they've said on my page, I don't want I don't want him associated with this family. I don't want him associated as the nephew. He might be a step nephew or a step great nephew. He wants to be rude to this family and spread lies. Well then we're going to treat him what he is. And that's all I gotta say about that. I hope you learned something. Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not. I find myself on the topic of rumors again surrounding my uncle. Rumors created by people that don't know what they're talking about. So let's get into it, because this is my life now. Snopes, an article that I came across. Colonel Sanders left money to the KKK question mark. Did Colonel Sanders will direct KFC to give money to the KKK? First off, let me end this by saying Colonel Sanders did not have a will. In fact, he had no will, no notarized will. Everything went to his estate, and he also sold out a KFC in 1964 and gave up ownership of his Canadian franchises in 1972 when he gave them the charity, and that charity went towards education of KFC employees. The further on the will that didn't exist, that so many people in the family remember one being talked about, but it never happened. Claudia, after everything was auctioned off and the money given to charities, Claudia got what she got. The daughters got nothing, so they had to take Claudia to the court, sue her, and they got a child's portion each, 
of what was left over. Because there was no will. Last year when I started uh, doing TikTok content about my uncle and my family history and addressing rumors and doing research and, you know, just trying to figure out what is true and what is bullcrap. People asked me if it was true that Colonel Sanders had a will that KFC would feed the homeless. And I always said, no, that's not true because he didn't have a will when he died. So later on, like this year, I scroll on, I see this claim. Colonel Sanders left instructions requiring KFC to donate money to the Ku Klux Klan or feed the homeless for free. It's false, obviously, because Snopes had to say it's false. But it's false. So now I am learning that that question or rumor that people had of Colonel Sanders having a will and having KFC in that will feed homeless people derives from a racist theory and rumor that somebody decided to spread. Every single one of these, and you can see it down here in the corner of the screen, I have the Snopes website up. Every claim and theory has come from I heard, my brother swears, I heard, I heard. Like, all the claims are I heard. They're naive, uneducated people that don't know what they're talking about, just spreading rumors to spread rumors. You know, some people maliciously, maliciously spread rumors about Colonel Sanders because they weren't getting money from him anymore and they wanted to hurt his image in Corbin, Kentucky. We've already addressed that one. And that's where the owning slaves and stealing the recipe from a slave came from. But we already talked about him being born in 1890. His recipe wasn't developed until the 30s. The image of Miss Childress is Sarah Clark from the Ladies Home Journal 1925 magazine. Miss Childress didn't exist in the sense there's probably a Miss Childress of that time. But the person that people are referring to didn't exist as Miss Childress and the story is fake. The image is Sarah Clark, and her story is being erased by idiots like this that make up rumors and spread them around like they're truth, and people believe them. But like I said, Snopes is disproving it, so you have to believe it now because someone outside of the family is telling you that it is fake. All of this is, I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard a rumor, I heard a rumor, and then it was all dodged by Ray Kroc, McDonald's, Carl Karcher of Carl's Jr., Dave Thomas of Wendy's, and Harlan Sanders himself. Uh, you go on to read about all this stuff. They hit it right on the nail here. Naive people see the colonel dressed in a white suit with his white hair, white goatee, and mustache. And they must think he's a clan sympathizer. So they create that rumor. He started wearing a black suit. He started off wearing a black suit. He had several different colored suits that he wore. And he got tired of getting flower stains on his suit while cooking. Pete Harmon had suggested to him to wear a white suit to cover the flower stains, to save money on dry cleaning, and to look more professional while cooking. So he did this and it became iconic and that's why the white suit is there. And if any of you did your research, you would know that. It goes on, talks about history and more claims and all this good stuff. Ah! People, come on. Come on. How many times am I going to have to address a rumor like this? There are so many out there. And even like Snopes, they dis they disprove it. They say it's fake. They show the proof that it's fake. And people still spread it around like it's truth and people believe it. I mean, come on, folks. It's very easy to attack a man that is dead and can no longer defend himself. It has gotten to a point now where my family just doesn't care what people say. That we know the truth and that's all that matters. Let people talk. I'm on the internet. I am somewhat of a influencer now. And I get tired of having the stuff thrown in my face. You know how I came across this article? I, I've heard rumors of people asking if he was part of the KKK. I've heard people ask me if he was. And I told them no. He wasn't. 
Ray Callender, one of his assistants before Dick Miller became his full-time assistant, said that the colonel was not a racist. There wasn't a racist bone in his body. And if there was a misconception of him being racist, he wanted to change that. He wanted to prove to people that he wasn't. I've had people come to me about that rumor, and I had no idea where it came from. And I'm learning that it is originating from the rumor that he had a will that the homeless shall be fed. Let's go a little bit more into the whole Kentucky Fried Chicken sale in 1964 so people understand. Colonel Sanders was offered $2 million to sell his chicken seasoning and his franchising am empire. $2 million. And a $40,000 a year salary, $40,000, $45,000 a year salary to be the spokesperson and remain on the board of directors for Kentucky Fried Chicken. He sold all of his assets and ownership of Kentucky Fried Chicken except for the Canadian franchises. And he helped build new franchisees in Canada because he believed you could do things on a handshake up there and there was none of this legal issue stuff with uh, corporations like there was in the United States at the time. He kept those until 1972 and he created the Colonel Harlan Sanders Foundation and he gave those to charity, no longer under his control. He was still the spokesperson the goodwill ambassador for the brand until his death on December 16th, 1980. He had no will. And the fact that he sold out of his ownership in 64 and gave up his ownership in 72 of Canada's franchises, he had no say in what the brand would do after his death, even if he had a will. He had no right to tell the brand after he died, because he had no ownership of it, what to do if a homeless person came in. This rumor was claiming that he threatened them that they will either give a million dollars to the clan or feed the homeless for free. Who sits, who sits there and just makes this crap up? That's what I want to know. Who is sitting in their home right now making this crap up? Why? Why are you doing this? It won't make you money. You're obviously hiding. You make these rumors up. You don't put your name behind it. It's all unknown sources. So... I don't know, people. I get so flustered about this stuff. I mean, it's not accusing me or anyone living today. It's accusing a man that I never met that I have such respect for because of what a good person he was. If, if Colonel Sanders was a bad man or did anything bad, I would tell you about it. I would tell you about it. Believe me, don't believe me. I do not care. But I would tell you about it. The worst thing he did was cheat on his wife and then he married the person he cheated on her with. That caused drama. That is the only rumor that is true that I have heard. Colonel Sanders did not steal his recipe. Colonel Sanders did not own slaves. Colonel Sanders was not racist. <sighs> How many times do I need to address? I mean, I, I've addressed it a thousand times, literally a thousand times on TikTok. And I've addressed it a few hundred times on Instagram. And I guess I'm going to address it a few hundred times on here until it sticks. Because this stuff never goes viral. It never does. And unless I'm like putting out a fake recipe, this stuff doesn't go viral. And it's sad. You know, truth doesn't go viral. Fake stuff does. And that's the problem with our society today. Anyway, so this rumor, and this entire rumor, is false. Um, hopefully YouTube doesn't flag this video for me saying the Klan or the KKK because this is an educational video to tell you that the entire claim that he was part of it or that he donated to it was false. And if you yourself want to try to accuse my uncle of something, please post the evidence. Don't post iffy articles. Don't post hearsay. Don't post the things like these guys had in their uh, reasoning for the rumor where it says, I heard this and I heard that. Give me some documents. Get me some images, videos, audio recordings from the day. And even at that, AI is incredible. 
You can make anything with AI, so you can't even believe that stuff. How long until somebody starts making AI of anybody and just defaming them for it, you know? Show the evidence if it's true, and I'll admit it. If all you have is hearsay and rumors, shut up, you're getting blocked. <laughs> Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not. This video I wanted to talk and touch base on the history with Uncle Harley visiting different franchisees and what he would do to make sure that his quality was being kept up to standards. The first thing that he did when he walked into a restaurant was reach his hand, grab a fistful of flour, squeeze it, and if it made a cob in his hand, he knew it was the right kind of flour. Last year I had no idea what kind of flour was used, and after talking to several different people and finally getting to the right people that knew Uncle Harley and worked in the early days of Kentucky Fried Chicken that's still around today, we learned that they used cake flour. He used cake flour. It was very fine flour. That was the key to getting it golden brown as well in the amount of time that it took to cook it. You use a very fine type of flour, like cake flour, your chicken will come out brown. The texture of it will be slightly different than what you're used to with extra crispy. So, people would add, franchisees would add an extra two pounds, three pounds of flour to the mix to stretch out the ingredients. Or they would use a different type, like whole wheat flour, a thicker flour to stretch out the ingredients and make them last longer so they didn't have to reorder the spice blend as often as they had to. Uncle Harley believed that this depreciated the value of his product that he had to sell. I see at the time, the family, Cousin Lee, Claudia, and mainly Claudia, because Cousin Lee was helping franchise Kentucky Fried Chicken across the country with the Colonel, they would mix and supply the recipe. On the back porch, they had this big metal drum and a snow shovel and they would get the ratios that were needed and they would mix it inside the giant drum now whether claudio knew part of it lee knew part of it uncle jim knew part of it you know i don't know if it was split up between all of them or if they all gatheredly knew it uh the story is that they all knew it and they took it with them to the grave but uh anyway so they they would mix that in the big drum with the snow shovel they would package that, and then that would be how the franchisees got their spice blend. They got their mixes. So when Uncle Harley and the family were providing that before any company was providing it, they didn't want to reorder it as often for some of the franchisees. So they'd make some changes to the flour, and they'd either change it from cake flour to a different flour or add a few extra pounds of flour to stretch out the ingredients. And that's why at some of those locations, it didn't taste right. It depreciated the flavor of the chicken because then the ratios from spice blend to flour were not accurate. And therefore, it changed the recipe and made some changes to it. And Uncle Harley got very fussy over that, rightfully so. I today would get fussy over that if I went to a franchise and they were doing that to cut corners. And this is something that goes on today. They don't use cake flour anymore today, but it... They stretch out the ingredients. I believe that some franchisees that just want to cut corners and get done with the day, they stretch out the ingredients with extra pounds of flour. That's what Uncle Harley's biggest complaint was with franchisees, both when he owned the business and after he sold it, where franchisees wanted to cut corners. They didn't want to do things right. They wanted to make changes that they believed were better and faster for the company. So that's when you go to a restaurant today. And the chicken just doesn't taste like that there's any spice there and it just tastes like salt. That's why is because they're stretching out the ingredients throughout the flour with extra pounds of flour. See, the salt is now in the spice blend mix. It wasn't before. Uncle Harley would mix the 11 herbs and spices. He'd have those made. And then you add salt to the flour. And he had specific ingredients and brands of the salt and the flour. And he would provide the seasonings. And he would have explicit instructions on how to mix it with the flour. And he always added the salt after the spice blend was mixed with the flour. So, but anyways, they might be doing that. They, they stretch out the ingredients and then they just add some extra salt to it. You know, that, that's highly likely at these locations that aren't doing things right. Now, I don't travel around 
to make sure Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants are doing it right. I don't even work for the brand. For eight years, I spoke out against them because of the quality that I had at several locations in Florida. And the treatment that I had online from their social team and their advertisements disrespecting my family. But in April of this year, they proved to me that they still do things good. They can still do things good and they're committed to keeping the history alive. Because in April, KFC invited my family out to Corbin and we had a great time. We made up all that stuff's behind us. But that doesn't change the fact of the history and what Uncle Harley thought and said and did. And so, rightfully so, you can understand why he was fussy about the flour not being right. The next thing he didn't like was the gravy changing. And by changing, I think they started... I don't know what year they actually started dehydrating it. And there's nothing really wrong with dehydrated potatoes, instant mashed potatoes, or the dehydrated gravy. You just add water to it. And if you do it right, you don't rush through it, you do the right ratio, it comes out great. Because it's the same thing, it just comes out great. But people weren't doing it just right, and Uncle Harley didn't like the changes that they were making. And they call it slop and throw it in the trash. There was one story, a um, franchisee was having their employees set up all the sides, the coleslaw, the mashed potatoes, the gravy, all on a counter, ready to go out instead of making it fresh each time. And Uncle Harley took his cane and said, not today. Swiped it off the counter into the trash and said, you're going to make it from scratch today. And they did. They made it from scratch. So, I just wanted to touch base on some of that stuff. There's some things I don't know. And there's some more things to learn. And I do a lot of research on this. I don't have to do it, but I do. I do a lot of research on this because I want to understand myself what Uncle Harley went through and what the franchisees went through when he was alive. And that to me is important to know when talking about things because if someone brings something up and I don't know about it, I have to say I don't know about it. So I'd like to know about it. It's an important note that just because you're born in the family doesn't mean you're born with the knowledge. I had to have the want to learn. So I was, had the willingness and the want to learn and that's what I do. Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not. And we're going to talk about the six takeaways from KFC's U.S. headquarters. They're going to talk about Nick Chavez, the CMO of Kentucky Fried Chicken now. He was formerly with um, Nintendo as their chief marketing officer. And now he's with Kentucky Fried Chicken. And before I get into this, I did reach out to Nick Chavez on Twitter when I did have that. And I asked him not to do what the previous administration with Kentucky Fried Chicken did with my uncle's image. And I think he thought that I was trolling and that I wasn't who I claimed to be. And I ended up getting blocked. But I hold nothing against him now. I did then. I don't now, now that I think about it. But uh, hopefully I get in contact with him sometime and try to get the family involved with marketing because I have some ideas myself. Anyways, I personally like Nick Chavez because he has done great things with the brand so far. I really enjoy the advertisements that he comes out with now. I really enjoy the new marketing ideas with the boneless nuggets and a few other menu items on the Kentucky Fried Chicken menu that came out this year. Matter of fact, his ideas are part of what brought me back to the brand. You know, for eight years I was against them because of their advertising, disrespecting Uncle Harley. And although his ideas aren't the only thing that brought me back, they are part of what brought me back. I got to sit down with the brand in April of this year and discuss the issues that we had, and which is all I've been asking to do for eight years, whether they changed anything or not. I wanted to talk with them so that they knew the family still existed and that we have opinions about how our uncle is portrayed. And we did that. And then to add a bonus to that, they gave us food. They didn't charge us for it. They insisted we try it. And we got the new menu items that Nick Chavez has been responsible for helping introduce to the brand. And those brought me back on board 100%. So I'm no longer upset about those old ads. I'm not upset about their quality. This year they have proven to me that they are doing better. So I have no problem talking about them in a good light. He goes on here to talk about the history of its finger looking good with Dave Harmon. And yes, this is a true story. He goes on to also talk about how they really want to live up to the standard of those old days. And they want to reach out to a younger audience 
And rather than pouring so much attention into the advertisements and marketing of Uncle Harley bringing him back, although regardless what I think of it, it did bring attention to the brand and people started talking about it more. This guy figures if we focus on the quality of the food and the menu, that would be better than just the advertising aspect of it, which I have been saying that for eight years and good on him for that. I absolutely agree with that. I have immense respect for this guy and what he is doing with marketing right now. And there is evidence here that the marketing aspects that he is doing with the menu and reaching out to younger audiences is working. It's paying off. Bringing in younger consumers has impacted the company's innovation strategy. As Chavez noted, younger consumers tend to have more sophisticated, adventurous palates. They're also more diverse, which has also been an international focus for the brand. We have initially shifted our strategy to be more inclusive in our advertising, marketing the food we develop, and we have seen a market shift in demographics towards black and African-American consumers, which is something we are proud of, Chavez said. Also, those younger and more diverse customers have more diverse flavor palettes. They are much more interested in flavor profiles with spice and heat. That is absolutely right. I, I am too. I like spiciness. Anyways, that is why KFC recently launched a hot and spicy wing test, for instance, and has added more sauce to the lineup, including Buffalo Ranch, late this year. The chain currently has five dip cup sauces and two additional sauces and packs. Expect more sauce innovation from the brand moving forward. Younger consumers are not only diverse from heat and standpoint, but they also dip, drench, and sauce everything. Everything, Chavez said. That's accurate. That's why we upped our sauce game with Buffalo Ranch and Candily. We still have gaps and are working to fill those. KFC's strategy to attract younger, more diverse customers doesn't mean it's abandoning its core customers. These customers tend to be older and lower income, according to Chavez. So it's imperative to offer exceptional value to appeal to this demographic. The chain recently launched a new $20 fill-up box with a four-piece of original recipe chicken, 12 nuggets, extra-large fries, four biscuits, and four dipping sauces. KFC is also testing a $20 taste of KFC offering in Florida that is heavier on the size, Chavez said. The test has gotten off to an explosive start. KFC is all in on influencers. Well, this part I almost have to um, disagree with. I'm Colonel Sanders' nephew, and I hold the title, you know, I have the genes, I look like him. I know the history in and out. I am a social media influencer. Maybe not on YouTube, but on TikTok I am. And I've seen them use influencers that I've never heard of and other people have never heard of before. So there's no excuse why they wouldn't use me. But maybe if I get a few more million followers on my other platforms, they might consider it. But anyways, KFC is all in on influencers. As with most companies, KFC has adjusted the marketing strategy towards social media and streaming services to appeal to younger customers. Javis pointed to KFC's partnership with Colorado Buffalo's football coach, Deion Sanders. I did like that. I like that commercial. And family as an example of powerful impact social media has. He goes on to talk about how Coach Sanders posted this, the Kentucky Fried Chicken ads to his uh, content on his social channels, and it had a great reaction. And they go on to talk about how the spotlight has moved from the kernel to the menu, which technically is a good thing. Instead of having all these different actors, they're focusing on the food, which is good. <laughs> Howdy, folks. I'm Colonel Sanders, and you're not. What I usually do on TikTok is just talk about the history. Somebody has a question about Kentucky Fried Chicken or Uncle Harley, I'm able to answer it, or I'm able to find out the answer, and then I make a 60-second video explaining the whole situation that they want to know. So, as always, if you have a question that I haven't addressed, or maybe you can't find the answer to, or I have addressed and you can't find that video, comment it below and I will address it, no matter what it is. However, I always say be respectful, because if you come across being a jerk, I am going to give you the same energy back. With that said, this is a video about Uncle Harley. It's some kind of you know, documentary somebody did on YouTube. I'm going to watch it. I'm trying to find the food that built America, 
entire play or not playlist but entire episode so i could watch it through and through of the kentucky fried chicken segment of it so i could tell you whether it's accurate or not now it's important to know i don't know everything but i can figure out anything so like i say what people don't have access to is talking to my family that was there and that was truthful and i say that was truthful because there is family that's not truthful joe lettington a step cousin of mine step nephew to the colonel he has spouted off nothing but lies since I've seen him release a recipe in Corbin, Kentucky. That was absolutely bogus. So uh, people like that, I don't trust in the family with their information that they have. But other family I do, such as Lee's daughter and my grandfather, who both knew the colonel very well. And I get to explain their stories through my page to y'all. And most of my information has come from them as well as doing research and what lines up with research is uh, also what lines up with the family stories that I have the both of them fill in the gaps of things that are missing and uh, yeah so I do I do a lot of research uh, I do a lot of research I talked to a lot of uh, family that was involved and knew him and I talked to people who knew him in general such as Mary and Kay Spices and a few other franchisees of Kentucky Fried Chicken in its past. So, anyways, if you know me and you know anything about my content, you know that I do my research and that I have my sources on how I know what I know. And that's why people trust me to give you the most accurate information possible. And I'm sure the food that built America has done a great job covering it. I saw one clip talking about the pressure fryers, and though they didn't cover every single aspect of it, they did cover a pretty good chunk of it. And um, it was pretty accurate. So I just uploaded that clip that somebody sent me to my page so people knew that I saw it. And, uh, so anyways, we're going to watch this one and we're going to see how accurate it is. Announcing the portable Sunday dinner by Colonel Sanders. He cooks up Kentucky Fried Chicken in his kitchen, then packs it up in his handy bucket. All you do is pick it up. Imagine the best meal of the week travels everywhere. Actually, I have a pin like this there. The week. Okay, Colonel, hit the road. Making the perfect fried chicken as we know it, juicy on the inside, crispy on the outside, used to be a luxury because of how long it took to make. But a man named Harlan Sanders changed that after mastering his own recipe and shortening the cooking time from 30 minutes to under 10. A survivor of the Great Depression and World War II, he journeyed across the US to start a franchise. After being rejected over a thousand times, he went from being given $105 from social security checks to millions of dollars for his franchise. That is accurate. Uh, he, the exact number of people rejecting him was 1,009. Welcome to Hook. And immediately back then, in the very back, we had two bedrooms and a bathroom there, you see. On September 9th of 1890, Harlan was born on a farm, three miles from Henryville, Indiana. It was in when he was six Indiana. years old, his father passed away. His mother had no choice but to work, sewing for other families and peeling tomatoes at a canning factory. Harlan had to accurate. look after his younger siblings That's and do most of the cooking. That's my grandpa there on the left. By the time he was seven years old, he had mastered bread and vegetables and was already getting better at meat. Some days, he would stay up until 11 or 11.30 at night cooking. When he turned 10, he got his first job working on a farm. As a it's kid, Charlie he got Norris. easily distracted by the animals and was fired after just a month. His mother asked if he would ever amount to anything. I'm going to pause that there. He worked for Charlie Norris on that farm and he got $2 a month. And because he only worked there a month, he only got $2. So Charlie Norris gave him that $2. And they're going to go into the tongue lashing that my three great grandmother Margaret gave her son Harland. Uh, Uncle Harley ha had that resonate with him for the rest of his life that he would do the best job possible no matter what it was next time somebody trusted him with the job. And that's where his good work ethic uh, sprung from. Thing in life. She said to him, Here you are, my oldest son. Your father is dead and you're the only one I can look to for help with the other children. And you're no account. You can't even hold a job for $2 a month. Ashamed from disappointing her, he told himself that he would work harder the next time he got a job. When he was 12 years old, his mother married a man who didn't like the idea of having stepchildren. So after a year, he left home and worked on a farm again. 
He got up before dawn to feed the animals, went to school during the day, and did odd jobs in the evening. Some nights, he shucked corn until about 8 or 9 at night. When he was 13 years old, he started 7th grade and dropped out after 2 weeks. He found algebra too difficult. He continued to work on the farm for 2 years before pursuing several different jobs. He worked as a streetcar conductor, soldier, Accurate. railroad fireman, insurance salesman, steamboat operator, lighting manufacturer, tire seller, and a lawyer. At one point, his... You can pause that real quick. His uh, soldier days, he was a wagoneer he, or wagon driver in Cuba during the occupation of Cuba. When he was 16, he fibbed his age and was stationed over there for one year before being sent back. And some of the stories that I heard, I haven't heard this part directly from the family. I've read about it. it. Was he got seasick on the ship ride to Cuba that he lost a lot of weight from, you know, puking overboard. All right, now let's learn about Josephine. His first wife, Josephine King, left him with their children because he got fired so many times. That's accurate. It wasn't until he started working as a gas station operator that his luck changed. In 1924, he hitchhiked from Louisville to Winchester after job hunting. He was picked up by the general manager of Standard Oil Kentucky, an oil and gas company. Harlan didn't know who he was at the time and told him what he had been through and why he didn't have a job. So he asked Harlan if he was interested in running a gas station in Nicholasville. Harlan didn't hesitate to say That would be the yes. Shell station, the super In the shell. early days, the business was slow since customers were loyal to the last person who ran the station. Some people in the town wouldn't even look. I see that it says Standard Oil Company, but there is a photo specifically of Uncle Harley and Aunt Josephine standing in front of a super shell uh, gas pump, which was part of this Nicholasville station, which was closed in 1929. But the same year, 1929, he took over the lease of the Pure and Oil Station in Corbin, Kentucky, where he had more exposure to the highway. And that's where he added on the Sanders Court and the cafe, expanded his... Um, seating area to seat a hundred customers and that's and that is where that stemmed from now his shootout they haven't got to that yet i don't know if they're going to get it accurate or not but the shootout with matt stewart happened during the nicholasville uh reign over that gas station not the one that kentucky fried chicken's recipe was born at it was his first station so let's see if they go into that look his way so Harlan decided to focus on customer service and always offered something extra. Eventually, he earned more than $12,000 a month from selling gas, which was three times more than anyone else had ever sold. But his luck took a turn for the worse when the Great Depression hit America. To make rent, Harlan sold his own equipment. He realized that there was no point in staying, so he quit. Fortunately, another oil and gas company, Shell, asked That's him to run I'm a gas station of. that was being built in Corbin. He knew it was the only other way he could make money again, so he accepted their offer and moved to Corbin. Now, here, here's the confusion. I know about the Shell station, but the Corbin station was the pure in oil. So maybe I'm about to learn something because all the research that I have before I did the research, I only knew about the one station in Corbin, which I coined as the Shell station. But when I went to Corbin, Kentucky, I noticed it said pure and oil on it in Corbin, Kentucky. And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So we did some more research and we found out that the shell one was older than the pure and oil. The pure and oil was the one in Corbin. This might teach me something else and we're about to find out if it does. But my research and all the information that I have says that the shell station was in Nicholasville where the shootout happened and the pure and oil was in Corbin. Harbin in 1930. To make extra money, Harlan sometimes made meals for customers and had a single table that could seat six people. Of course we have an ad. At first, he only made country ham, string beans, okra, hot biscuits, and later added fried chicken, which became his I best added seller. Those biscuits recipes to a famous in his video memoir, on he wrote, I believe that fried chicken is North America's hospitality dish. I spelt all of those words with capital letters. By 1937, his food became so popular by word of mouth that people came to visit him from different states. So he expanded his gas station to include a motel and cafe that could seat 142 See, it says people. Pure on Around this time, shell. he had discovered so a huge got problem. That wrong. He couldn't pan fry the chicken fast enough. When he cooked the chicken after an order was placed, the customer had to wait 30 minutes. If he made a batch in advance, he often had to throw away pieces at night. The only other option was deep frying immersing the chicken in a wire basket in deep fat. 
While it cooked the chicken faster, it made it dry, crusty, and unevenly done. But after discovering a pressure cooker, a new invention at the time, and using it for cooking his vegetables, he made a historic breakthrough. He came up with the idea of using the new invention for cooking his chicken too. After many experiments, he found the right balance of pressure, cooking time, meat, fat, and fat filtration. The pressure cooker sealed in the chicken's flavor, preserved its moisture, and gave it a soft finish that wasn't greasy or crusty. It cut down the cooking time to 8 or 9 minutes. At the time, he was still refining the seasoning. He started 10. with pepper and salts and ended up making several different kinds. Then one day, he got an order for 500 fried chicken meals. Since they weren't for his regular customers, he decided to try a new seasoning. It turned out to be the best fried chicken he had ever had in his life. So he stuck with it. And the official story from Margaret, my uh, cousin Margaret, who was the one of the colonel's daughters. The official story from her was that there was some hungry fishermen that were coming by. And that's right. It was, I don't know the exact number of food that they ordered, but it wasn't the exact same customers. So he decided to experiment with his 10 herbs and spices and add an 11th one. And Margaret came in to taste test that. And she said, that's it. That's the one. And he didn't change the recipe from that day. During the time of him owning the service station in Corbin, he nailed that to the door jam of the kitchen and told her, if I die or something happens to me, you can continue on with the recipe here. Now, it's unclear whether Margaret and Mildred knew the recipe or had it because of that situation. They might have and they might have not. But before anybody goes bothering their family, looking them up to find out who they are, none of the family has the recipe. I have one cousin that claims maybe they do and they have a very good reason of knowing it. And the colonel's grandchildren would have a very good reason of knowing it, but they have outright said they don't have it. And whether that's true or not, we are to respect that. Just like when I say I don't have it. I will give you what is public information and that is all. Everything else, it doesn't matter because it's a secret recipe. But anyways, let's continue. Called it his secret blend of 11 herbs and spices. Not long after, his restaurant was listed in the book Adventures in Good Eating, a Duncan Hines book. Yep. Good eating places along the highways Duncan of America. Duncan Hines was also a But Kentucky in 1939, Colonel. his luck took a turn for the worse again. After building a second motel and cafe in Asheville, his first one in Corbin burnt down on Thanksgiving. That's accurate. By the time it was rebuilt, there weren't any more tourists or vacationers around because of World War II. That's accurate. So he sold his Asheville location and started working for other... The reason why that was is because there was a select number of states rationing their gas off to help the Americans in the efforts overseas during the war. And because of that, it rendered the Asheville, North Carolina location useless. He couldn't, he couldn't sell it or he couldn't use it. He couldn't operate it. It became inoperable. So he sold the properties and he moved back to Corbin, Kentucky and he picked up another job. And the whole burning down of the one in Corbin, Kentucky is accurate. Restaurants and cafeterias. When the war was over, Harlan started another restaurant in Georgetown and allowed a former colleague to run it. He gave him $300 a month and half of the profits. Despite Harlan's generosity, That's his former colleague turned shell against station him. Behind it, he opened the restaurant as a partnership with both their names behind Harlan's back, so Harlan had to buy him out to fire him. In 1953, Harlan received a call from a real estate agent. Now that story about the person going behind his back, I don't know about that story. That's a new one to me. That's something new that I learned. I'm going to have to do more research on that to see if it's accurate for me to say it. But just going by this, uh, they have had some inaccuracies in this video so far. But you know, that's an interesting piece that I didn't know about. I didn't know he opened another restaurant, paid a guy $300 a month to run it, and the guy went behind his back. I didn't know that. Agent who offered him $164,000 in cash for his motel and cafe. Harlan turned him down. His motel and cafe was right on the highway, and 90% of his business came from tourists. Still, the agent called him the next day and tried to convince him again. In his memoir, he wrote, There is no point in selling out. My motel was right on the highway. That, in itself, was worth a fortune. Yep. I was just as happy as I could be. With business booming, Harlan thought he was set for life. But six months later, he regretted his decision not to sell. 
because they opened the A highway the new junction highway. in front moved to another site and cut down the flow of traffic. Afterwards, it was announced that a new interstate highway would bypass it altogether. Harlan was convinced that his business was doomed. So in 1956, he auctioned it off for $75,000, less than half of what the real estate agent offered him. At 66 years old, he had to live off his savings and social security checks an of $105 a month. See everything from miles away with this powerful U.S. Special Forces device. This new military man don't care. But he had a new business idea, a fried chicken franchise called Kentucky Fried Chicken. In fact, he already had some lined up. Years before, Harlan taught his good friend Pete Herman how to cook his chicken. When Pete served it in his restaurant, business went up by 75%. So Harlan lined up a few more franchises, all before the highway change. When he decided to pursue this path, he put a couple pressure cookers and a bag of seasoning in his car and hit the road. If he came This is when Cousin Lee was also with him, helping him do this. Another fun fact that I learned from Lee's daughter's husband was that Uncle Harley never sold one of his pressure cookers. He always rented them out. Came across a decent looking restaurant, he would beg the owner to let him cook his chicken for the employees. If they were impressed, he offered to stay for a couple of days and cook for the restaurant, hoping that it would lead to another franchise opportunity. To cover his travel expenses, he would get free meals from his friends and slept in the back seat of his car. In his memoir, he wrote, Looking back, it seems now that one of the most courageous things I ever did was to start out in my car with a pressure cooker to sell my first Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise. As I say, I had no money except for my monthly social security check, but I had 3,500 brochures printed. I expected to get some inquiries as a result of those brochures, but I don't think I ever got more than two or three. Within a couple years, Harlan didn't have to make those trips anymore people went to him instead. He did all the bookkeeping and other paperwork, and his second wife, Claudia Price, mixed, packed, and shipped their secret plan of 11 herbs and spices. Harlan didn't share the recipe with his franchises because he was scared it would fall into the hands of competitors. By 1963, there were over 600 KFC franchises in the US and Canada. Finally, he was financially secure, but he worried about what would become of his company after his death. Over the years, several people asked to buy his company, including a 29-year-old lawyer named John Brown. John's grandfather was a farmer who taught him the same work ethic that Harlan learned two generations earlier. He met Harlan in 1963 when he was asked to become his full-time attorney. After he had said no, the two ended up talking about Harlan's favorite topic, fried chicken. John was amazed to learn that Harlan had hundreds of franchises around the US and Canada. In an interview, John shared, when I heard that, I imagined that he had salesmen everywhere. I said, well, Colonel, how many salesmen do you have out in the field? And he said, oh, we don't solicit. We don't believe in solicitation. He started to think about what would happen if they were more aggressive with sales. But before they parted, he agreed That's to take Jackson over a barbecue Massey. franchise I don't know why they blurred that Harlan out. was planning to build instead. He raised the money he needed from a millionaire named Jack Macy and started learning about the barbecue business. He discovered that barbecue only had a regional appeal and that the real money was in fried chicken. So he and Jack decided to buy Harlan's well, that's company. Why they it out. They in 1963, ready to show you yet. they made their first offer. Harlan said a sale was out of the question. They argued that Harlan should enjoy his life now and that if he died before selling his franchise, most of his estate would go towards taxes. They offered Harlan $2 million, which would have been over $15 million today. They also promised to maintain quality and treat his franchises fairly. To Harlan, their proposal made sense, but somehow didn't feel right. It felt like a father selling his child. He took his time to think about it while John continued to try and convince him. On January 6th of 1964, Harlan finally gave in and sold his company. He was 73 years old at the time. Looking back on his journey, he shared, every failure is a stepping stone to something better. I was rejected a thousand and nine times before selling my first franchise and then my company for two million. So many other people have strived through adversity that it will embarrass you. Okay. Some people just um, know what road to take. Something that they didn't get on that is after he sold, it was in the contract that they would maintain his recipe and his quality. When they discovered that this wasn't going to happen, or when he discovered that, he would argue with them. He threatened to go on Johnny Carson and tell them how bad the food was going to be. 
or how bad the food was, how bad the food had become. What had happened during that time is Jaxie Massey had moved Kentucky Fried Chicken headquarters and he moved it to Tennessee. And Uncle Harley didn't like that. He didn't like the changes that they were making. When he sold, he was on the board of directors still. He was kept on the board of directors. He bought a home in Mississauga, Canada, and he would stay there four months out of the year. And he did that until 1973, and then it just became a vacation home that he stayed at. It could have been four months out of the year. It could have been whenever. There's a lot of misinformation about him living in Canada until the day he died, and that's not accurate. He owned the home just like he owned the home in Tampa, Florida, but the one in Tampa, Florida wasn't his primary residence. He had, uh, he had a home in Florida, he had a home in Kentucky, and he had a home in Canada. And by 1973, after he gave his franchises to charity in 1972, he was back in the United States as a primary resident. With that said, he was left on the board of directors. And when he threatened to go on Johnny Carson, Jack C. Massey resigned. They moved Kentucky Fried Chicken headquarters back to Kentucky. And Uncle Harley was given more control over the food and quality. It wouldn't be until the 1970s that Hubling, the parent company that bought out in 1971, would sue the colonel. And the colonel would sue them, countersue them, for changing his recipe and misuse of his name and image. They settled that lawsuit, paid him a million dollars, and told him that he had to change the name of the Claudia Sanders Dinner House, which at the time was the colonel's lady and that he had to sell it. So he did that, and he remained the spokesperson of the brand until uh, the day he died. They also got involved with Marion K. Spices, but that's another story for another video. All in all, this video here that they had is accurate, but there's some slight misinformation into it. Uh, my research shows Shell Station was the first station that he got. And then the pure and oil one who was the one in Corbin. So, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't uh, cover the gunfight in this, but the things out of the mem memoir of Colonel Sanders was accurate as well. So, is Hook accurate with their information? Yeah, yes and no. Mainly accurate. Um, if anybody has any requests for me to watch another one to see if I know anything enough to say whether it's accurate enough, tag it below in the comments and we'll see about doing that in the next long form video. Ciao. <laughs> you know, the other day, Kentucky Fried Chicken tweeted and said pumpkin spice is not part of their recipe. Now, it's clear that nobody that works for KFC, unless you're high up in the corporate uh, ranks, knows what the recipe is. Nobody outside of KFC knows what the recipe is unless you were formerly working for them and you have a non-disclosure agreement, which is an NDA. Pumpkin spice consists of all spice and ginger. Now, ginger is up in the air because there's only one video on Mary and Kay Spice's yeah, website. And I'm so proud of it because it's all 100% pure. There's no substitution there. No mixing two or three spices and you, to manufacture one. It, it's, it's just the highest quality in the world. Both of these, well, all of these spices. I know he, ginger is wonderful. I know he's uh, cinnamon. Where Uncle Harley refers to ginger and cinnamon in the recipe. I rule those two out because I think they're too overpowering of a flavor. If they are in the recipe, it's little tiny sprinkles. But gathered from all the public information between 99X and Kentucky Fried Chicken, 99X shows us allspice. And the Colonel made 99X, which is a similar recipe, but not exactly the same. There's some differences in that. And really, because of an image Kentucky Fried Chicken released a little bit ago, quite a while ago, there is a depiction of cloves, which is also in pumpkin spice. It's not confirmed documented. It's not on the FDA requirements on the back of the packaging between the 60s and now. Cloves has never been listed. But that image is there, so it's speculated. So we could speculate that it is part of it. And when it comes to cinnamon, cinnamon's in it as well. 
And because of that one video, alongside with ginger, cinnamon was listed, it could be speculated that too. So actually, pumpkin spice is more close to the Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe according to accurate factual speculation and documentation. And we're not going off of Joe Leddington's fake recipe because it says ginger on it. We're going to go by the video on Marion K. Spice's website where he mentioned ginger. And if you don't want to include ginger because the only speculation on that's the video documented on 99X, which is a similar recipe to Kentucky Fried Chicken, has allspice. And you cannot convince me that allspice is not in the Kentucky Fried Chicken original recipe. So therefore, still, it stands that as far as the social media team knows and anybody else that says pumpkin spice isn't part of the KFC recipe, part of pumpkin spice is part of the KFC recipe. Just saying. Happy spooky season, everybody. Special pressure cooking? So it's always tender and juicy. Looks like you've learned to make great chicken. Only way to serve our customers right. It's so nice, nice to live. So good about a meal. So good about Kentucky Fried Chicken. Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not. Chances are, if you're watching this particular video right now, you've been following the entire series about the recipe, all the information I know about it, and how much that has changed over the years. What I can tell you is between 99X and Kentucky Fried Chicken, we have sage, allspice, red pepper, coriander, white pepper, black pepper, garlic powder. Salt and MSG are not part of the 11. So that only gives us seven ingredients. There's a video on Marion K. Spices that I showed you already. And if you want to see that, you're going to have to go back in the other videos and watch it. Because that's where all of it's sourced. And I'm going to put this in the playlist that has that information. He talks about cinnamon and ginger being good spices from Marion K. Spices. Doesn't necessarily mean it's in 99X, but he's talking about it. So you could speculate those being in there and that would give you nine. So I've been saying nobody has it. And then the story came out that one of my cousins might have it. I don't know if they do or not, but I have talked with them about the public ingredients that we found, and they confirmed each and every one that we found publicly, except for cinnamon and ginger. They did not comment on those, but they commented on the other ones that are public domain on the FDA-required public listings on packaging meant to go out to public foods. And over the years, between the 60s and now, those labelings have changed. FDA requires anything with garlic to be listed. Kentucky Fried Chicken shows for a fact garlic powder on their 2020 packaging, and I assume that's still on there today, because it's legally required. 99X does not show it. Because of that fact alone, right there, shows you the undoubtable difference between the two, even though they were made by the same guy. And they're similar. Garlic powder is in Kentucky Fried Chicken. It is not in 99X. That's the only difference we know. Now, allspice, sage, and red pepper, and coriander could not be in Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they could be. I think they are, but they also could not be because the owner of Marion K said that they are different recipes, similar in nature, but different. But by him saying that, that's not confirming or denying those ingredients being in KFC's recipe or not. By him saying that, I can say, okay, so... What's similar? White pepper and black pepper, salt and MSG, are also recorded on Kentucky Fried Chicken's public listings. We know those are the same. Anything else is fair game. You can't convince me all spice isn't in it. I think coriander's in it. I think red pepper's in it. I think it's a little bit of it. Sage definitely has to be in it. It's listed in his autobiography. He mentions it. He also mentioned summer savory, but there's no documentation other than his book that mentions that. And even at that, he's not mentioning it in the recipe. He's just saying they're good ingredients you can use anywhere. So that's a hint towards it. So you got to understand, separate the facts, the seven facts from speculation and guessing. And when we get to the seven facts, my cousins confirmed the seven that we have. Can't really deny them because they're there in public domain anyways. But they did not speak on anything else. 
And that's what I always tell everyone as well. If it's not in public domain, I'm not going to speak on it. Because it just adds to the speculation. I want everything to be as factual as possible. I made it confusing on purpose because I want people to lose interest in it because I'm tired of being asked this question if we have the recipe. doesn't matter what I say, people don't believe it. But those seven ingredients are facts. They're 99X and Kentucky Fried Chicken. The only known difference, 100% known difference because of the legal requirements is garlic powder is in KFC. Garlic powder is not in 99X. So the only thing we know for a fact because of that legal requirement, that's what we know is different. It's entirely possible that he gave him 10 herbs and spices and left the 11th out. He wanted to convince KFC to use Mary and Kay to supply it, but they didn't want to use Mary and Kay. So this is all the information that I have and I have sourced it all. It's in the discord. It's in these playlists. It's on this channel. It's on TikTok. It's on Instagram. We cover all the public domain things that Kentucky Fried Chicken has hinted towards. They've given us images, drawings, hints, um, the FDA requirements, just everything that is out there, we have studied it. And when you want to eliminate any questionable information and you only want the things that cannot be doubted, you end up with seven ingredients with no measurements, no resources of where those ingredients originated from. You just have those seven ingredients that you know about because they are publicly on the listings between the 60s and now. And those that listing has changed. 99X doesn't contain allspice or red pepper on the back of their packaging anymore like they used to in the 90s. That's replaced with coriander. But because of that little thing, I add the 90s listing and the current listing, and then I add that to Kentucky Fried Chicken's listing, they do have similarities in their public information, and they do have differences. And again, I know I'm repeating myself, the only difference we know for a fact is garlic powder. Maybe you could take 99X and add garlic powder to it. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, point being, I proved Joe Lettington, my step cousin's recipe, to be wrong. He insisted that it was the recipe. He insisted it was the colonel's handwriting and that it was the recipe given to the family by him to be entrusted. I held the colonel's handwriting up in a video next to his handwriting, next to that um, recipe Joe Lettington had. Two completely different handwritings. Number four, oregano was spelled wrong. They add salt as one of the 11 ingredients, and it cannot be added. Fact, Colonel Sanders said that he added salt to the mix after the mix was made. After the 11 was mixed, he'd add salt to it. Joe Lettington's recipe has 10 herbs and spices and salt. He does not have 11. He has 10 and then salt, which is technically a mineral. It's flavorful, but it's a mineral. So that... The misspell on number four, salt as one of the ingredients, and the handwriting. Those three have disproved his story about that recipe, period. My cousins that say they might have it, that confirm the seven ingredients, have not shown me anything. They have not gone public. They have not gone to the news and shared what they have because they don't want any trouble and they don't want any attention for it. It's going to stay with them until the day that they're gone, and then it's truly gone out of anybody in this family's hands because they ain't getting handed down if they have it. Other cousins of mine, or other step-cousins that claim to have it, also refuse to share any information that they have about it, which makes me skeptical. They won't even confirm or deny ingredients that I found in public domain. Now, when I would leak a fake recipe for fun, they would come forth and say, oh, that is totally fake. Not the cousins that confirmed the seven for me. They ignored those. But the other step cousins, they straight out said, oh, that's fake. That's really fake. Okay. So here's the seven I found through public domain. And I released that because it's public domain. And I'm tired of people saying it's on the internet. The whole thing is out there. This is what the whole thing is. No. Okay. Here's the factual stuff that we have. Compare that to yours and then tell me if it matches. They were silent. The same people that told me that the other ones were obvious fakes were absolutely silent when I released those. That can mean one of two things. That can mean that I am right and they are keeping their mouth shut because they're shocked at how close I got, or they're wrong, but they don't want to be called out for being wrong. So they just decided to drop it, which is fine. I'd rather that happen than 
continue a lie like Joe Leddington has been doing. So, anyways, we made several videos about this recipe. And there's an entire series about it. I'd like to end the series. Unfortunately, this is something I'm always going to be asked about. But I'm hoping YouTube does its thing and people see the videos that are already out there. Study them up and down, left and right. Instead of me having to continuously make the same video over and over again, telling people that, telling people what public information that there is. So I hope YouTube leeches on to this particular video and the playlist that it's in. And somebody goes down a rabbit hole and decides to binge watch this entire series. You got to know when I'm joking. You got to know when I'm trying to mislead you and you got to know when it's factual and you got to pay attention to how I say things. Like I said, it's a secret recipe. It does not matter what it is. It does not matter who actually has it and who doesn't. It's a secret that nobody is ever going to get. The only things that we're ever going to get is what is public domain already. And why am I talking about the public domain things? It's because I'm tired of the people pretending to have it. I'm tired of people pretending to have it and holding it up above others' heads, acting like they're better than them because they have this big secret that the king of fried chicken had. I'm tired of it. So we look at what's actually public. Somebody from the family confirms what's actually public, shows you how it is true, disproves the fake ones, and then we could quit speculating about it and just focus on what we have as fact. You can have the seven ingredients, make up your own measurements, and create your own recipe based off of those seven ingredients. Salt and MSG will make it 13. And that is all we know. So, as Bill O'Reilly says, this is the no spin zone. This particular video is the no spin zone. We're not spinning anybody around in this video. I explained everything, and now it's up to you to do your research. You can, you're more than welcome to come back in this comment section and tell me what you find. But I'm telling you, any full 11 recipe, no matter who it's from, with measurements is fake. Because there's no way anybody can figure that out. Ciao. <laughs> Howdy, folks. I'm Colonel Sanders, and you're not. I made a few videos about 99X and a few videos about the recipe and stuff, the things that we know that are public information. I've also made trolling videos and people might not be able to separate the trolling from the facts. So I'm here to do that. And I've done that in one of my last videos, but I want to talk more about the recipe of 99X. Now, in my last video talking about the recipe, we showed the public ingredients between the 90s and now. We're not going to go into those public ingredients. We're going to talk about the history of it. In the 1980s, Kentucky Fried Chicken filed a lawsuit against Mary and Kay Spices. Thousands of people believe that that lawsuit was because Mary and Kay Spices was using the original recipe to Kentucky Fried Chicken because they had ties with Colonel Sanders. In the lawsuit, if you look it up, you can read how franchisees at Kentucky Fried Chicken were using Mary and Kate Spice's 99X and they were supplying these franchisees after Kentucky Fried Chicken strictly told them that they do not want to use Mary and Kate Spice's to supply the recipe. At the time they already had Sexton and Stange supplying the recipe and the Mary and Kate Spice's was caught supplying 200 franchisees at Kentucky Fried Chicken. You could read about that and all the coverage that there is about the lawsuit. And it was around 1983 was this lawsuit. So when you look it up, you want to look up Bill Summers, Mary and Kay Spice's Kentucky Fried Chicken lawsuit, 1980s. Anyway, so a lot of people think that this lawsuit happened because they were using the original recipe and supplying it to Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets because the colonel told them to do it after Kentucky Fried Chicken told them not to do it. There's some truths and there's some not so truths in these. Now, in my TikTok videos, I talk about this, but again, it all gets mixed up, including on shorts. It gets mixed up. Uh, sometimes the algorithm will show you the jokes and then show you the facts after, and you're not sure whether to believe it or not. If you're watching these long-form videos, I do not troll in the long-form videos, so know that now. And if you don't believe what I have to say, look it up for yourself, and you'll know. So that lawsuit happened in the 1980s. Colonel was already dead. From my family, I could fill in the blanks. Colonel Sanders was not happy with the changes that Kentucky Fried Chicken was making to his quality and menu across the country and Canada. In the 1960s, it is reported that it was 1965 
that Mary and Kay Spices struck a deal with Colonel Sanders to make a custom blend. That custom blend is 99X, and that custom blend was specifically made for him to serve in his restaurant. Uncle Harley loved this company so much that he believed everybody should try him. Everybody should work with them. He tried his darnest to get Kentucky Fried Chicken to use Mary and Kay to supply the recipe. He believed all the ingredients that they had to supply for any recipe were 100% pure. No substitutions. So this recipe was made, allegedly, according to official records in 1965 for the Claudia Sanders Dinner House. Uncle Harley went around to 200 franchisees at Kentucky Fried Chicken and told them to use this. This is better than what corporates have you use. This is absolute fact. This is how I got that story, him going around, handing around that recipe to the different franchisees. Not the recipe, but the bag mix of it. Got that from my family. That's not reported. They don't know how 200 franchisees got in contact with Mary and Kay Spices to purchase 99X. The reason why is because Colonel Sanders established that connection. So there is where they got the... 99X recipe to 200 franchisees and what sparked the lawsuit. After the colonel died, you know, they can't hold him accountable. He's dead. He died. They got caught in the 1980s and they filed the lawsuit against them. This led so many people to believe that 99X was the original recipe, but then because they were sued, KFC made them change one ingredient in the recipe of 99X to make it not the KFC recipe. And that is the official story that has spread around the world for anybody that knows anything about 99X. That's not a true story. It has some truths to it, but it's not absolutely true. I talked with Cordell Reed of Mary and Kay Spices. Cordell is Bill Summers' grandson. This company has been in the family for 101 years. He told me that there's a lot of big fish stories out there, unfortunately, but we don't bother addressing them because you know, they just sell spices. That's all they want to do. That's all they ever did. That lawsuit was dropped. They were not sued and then forced to change their ingredients like so many believe. 99X is 100% what it was the day it was made. Kentucky Fried Chicken, just before Bill Summers died, dropped the lawsuit because they had no grounds to sue. Mary and Kay Spice's motto was, anybody, the small man, the big man, we don't care who you are, you can buy from us. So anybody, they didn't care who it was, was welcome to buy their products for whatever, no questions asked. So 200 franchisees want to buy the product, okay, they don't care, they're going to sell it. They don't have an agreement with KFC not to sell their franchisees. That The franchisees have an agreement with KFC not to buy or supply anything that's not approved by corporate. So the lawsuit was dropped and nothing was forced to change. How KFC handled those 200 franchisees and their violation with their agreements, I have no idea. And quite frankly, I do not care. When it comes to the history of the whole thing, the lawsuit was dropped because it was the franchisees in violation, not Mary and Kay Spices. So Mary and Kay Spices has kept their ingredients the same since 1965. But that's another thing. It's not actually 1965 that it started. Cordell told me that his grandfather actually started working with Colonel Sanders, Uncle Harley, earlier. It was more the early 60s, maybe late 50s they got into contact with each other and they started working on a special blend. He believes that Uncle Harley had to give uh, Bill Summers, his grandfather, had to give him something, some bits and pieces of the recipe. So they came up with a recipe and some claim it as Claudia's. Some don't. Some claim it as just the Colonel's. But the Colonel and Bill Summers came up with this recipe for the Colonel's wife's restaurant that was similar to Kentucky Fried Chicken's, but different enough that it wouldn't infringe on anything. And that's what it was originally intended for. And my family on Lee's side owned a franchise in Tennessee of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they used, they called it the Colonel's Mix, that the Colonel made sure his recipe was being used at that location. My cousins did not know what 99X was or of its existence. 
Prior to the 90s, the bag was just an unlabeled gray bag, according to Cordell. There was no labeling on it. You couldn't really tell it was 99X. It's just a bag of seasoning. It's the early days. So Uncle Harley made sure that his spices were used in that restaurant, but they were using 99X. He supplied 99X. And when corporate would come to inspect that restaurant, they would move all the 99X spices out, which they believed was the Colonel's original recipe, and moved all the Kentucky Fried Chicken approved uh, seasonings in. And they would pass inspection, and the corporate would not understand why that place was doing so much better than any of the other franchisees in the area. And it was because they were using 99X. Um, we don't know what what the issue was, what changed at the time when Sexton and Stange was using uh, the recipe, they, they were supplying the recipe. It was a previous agreement with Brown and Massey that they would supply it. I don't know what was different. I, I, I don't know. Um, the only thing I know for a fact is garlic powder is in KFC and not in 99X. But Uncle Harley made sure that his seasonings, which 99X is technically his seasonings, was in that franchise so that they were serving something that he approved of. And that's that story. So 99X is not the recipe, but it's a similar recipe with slight differences. Today, McCormick and Griffith Laboratories supply what is needed for Kentucky Fried Chicken's chicken to do what it does. Previous things say, uh, even families say that the recipe's changed. I don't think so. I think the recipe stayed the same. But the suppliers and quality of the seasonings have changed as they change hands. That is my personal belief. So it's possible... Whatever Sexton and Stange was using was a lower grade quality of seasonings than Marion Kay. Because the video on Marion Kay's um, website of Colonel Sanders talking, he said that Marion Kay spices use 100% pure ingredients, no substitutions. So that tells me there that he believed whoever Kentucky Fried Chicken was using after he sold out was using substitutions for his ingredients, which would accurately line up with him accusing Brown and Massey of changing his recipe, even if it's a substitution for an ingredient, even if it's a uh, lower grade quality ingredient, but the same name. It's changing it. So he, he did believe they changed it. And then by the late 70s, uh, he threatened to go on Johnny Carson th and tell everybody how bad the food had become. And he was given, as one of the board of directors members, he was given more control over the quality at that point. So now they use McCormick. And McCormick is a great spice company. I don't, I don't have any complaints about McCormick. We use McCormick spices here in the house. Everybody does. Just about anybody that has a pantry with spices has McCormick branded stuff there. So there's nothing wrong with McCormick. Notice they no longer use uh, Sexton and Stange. They use McCormick. So I think that's a good move in, their, in, in its own. So, um, yeah, that's what that's... Absolutely, what could have changed was the quality or substitutions, because Uncle Harley made that comment that he knows that there's no substitutions with Marion K spices, and he believes everybody should have Marion K spices. And he loved to be in that position to be able to recommend them to everybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll link all the I'll link the sources and stuff in the dis, in the description of this video below here, and on my Discord we post all the sources on there for anybody who is really interested to dig deep into the KFC lore. All of our sources are in the Discord server, and that's more like a hub for everybody to channel through, and uh, you could communicate, you could talk, and whatever, but there's a lot of information and resources there for you to do the research that I have. But yeah, uh, 99X never changed. It's uh, not necessarily Claudia's recipe, but it was used for her restaurant, so it's coined as Claudia's Magic Flavor Chicken Seasoning Plus, Chicken Seasoning Plus is 99X plus salt, and they're both made from Marion K Spices and supplied by Marion K Spices. So, in that retrospect, Yahoo News reported it being Claudia's recipe. I believe that because I didn't know much about it, but then I finally got in contact with Marion K Spices and got to know what's what rather than what's on the internet.
We had a great conversation about that. And I asked him if I could give this information out and correct things and set the record straight on things. He said, absolutely no problem. So that's what I'm doing. 99X is 100% pure, no substitutions. Same thing that it was the day that it was made. There's a lot of big fish stories out there, a lot of misinterpretations of the stories out there, a lot of misunderstandings. This is the official you know, story of 99X. Bill Summers, Colonel Sanders created it, special blend by 65 for the Claudia Sanders Dinner House, formerly known as the Colonel's Lady. He gave it to 200 franchises at KFC, said, use this, this is better, whatever sex in the stage is having you use today. And those franchises continue to purchase that spice blend from Marion K. Spices. Colonel Sanders tried to get Marion K. Spices and Kentucky Fried Chicken working together and supplying it. KFC already had their agreement with Sex and Exchange and said, no, we will not have Marion K. Spices supply our seasonings. So Uncle Harley took it upon himself to supply 99X to these other franchises. Maybe in hopes that the franchises running these tests to see what it would be like, would be able to tell Kentucky Fried Chicken corporates or higher-ups, hey, this is actually really good. We think you might want to use them. And there's a lot more history in that. But that's the story of 99X. It's not the original recipe. It's a similar one. Only difference we know is garlic powder. I talked about that in the other videos. And that's it. Now, previously, last year, you'll see videos of me trolling fake ones fake recipes. Um, this because I wasn't as famous as I was as I am now. I'm not famous on YouTube. I'm famous on TikTok. I wasn't as well known as I am now. And now that I'm as well known as I am, I don't want to contribute to that misinformation. So I'm owning up to those fake recipes from last year that I purposely trolled. People knew that I was trolling them, but I own up that I did do that. And this year we're focusing on the facts. So that is the information of 99x don't believe me look it up and know for yourself give them a call and ask them about it ask them about 99x they'll sell it to you and they'll tell you their history of it it's best to get the history straight from the source than listening to a bunch of different articles online and people who think they know what they're talking about now hope to see you in my next videos um Ciao. <laughs> Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not, and I am going to be reviewing this article by the History Channel on History.com. Eight things you may not know about the real Colonel Sanders, and I'm going to tell you whether they're accurate or not. Or maybe I'm going to learn something. Before it became the world's second largest fast food chain, Kentucky Fried Chicken was the brainchild of a man named Harlan Sanders, Colonel Sanders who cooked up a simple country dishes at a roadside gas station. Even after his death in 1980, Sanders is still instantly recognizable face of the company. His life story and his road to fast food fame includes a lot more than just chicken. His first restaurant was inside of his gas station. That is accurate. It was the Sanders Cafe just off to the side of his pure and oil station. And then he also had added on the Sanders Court. When Harlan Sanders first began to serve meals to truck drivers at an old family dining room table, wheeled into the front of his Corbin, Kentucky service station in 1930, fried chicken was not on the menu because it took too long to prepare. Sanders' country ham and steak dinners proved so popular, however, that he soon opened Sanders' cafe across the street and began to serve chicken and fried in an iron skillet. Food critic Duncan Hines included the restaurant in his 1935 Road Food Guide, and it was there in 1939 that the colonel used pressure cookers to perfect his quick frying chicken coated in his secret recipe of 11 herbs and spices. That is accurate. And it wasn't until about 1940 that he completed his 11 herbs and spices. It was 10 herbs and spices, and he was playing around with it with different ingredients up until 1940 when he called it uh, done. He wounded a business rival in a deadly shootout. This is that story about Matt Stewart. The hot-headed Sanders never backed down from a fight which served him well in the rough and tumble Hell's Half Acre neighborhood that surrounded his Shell Oil gas station. When the future fast food giant painted over advertising signs on barns for miles around, the aggressive marketing tactic rank rankled Matt Stewart. 
who operated a nearby Standard Oil gas station. Now I want to pause right here. The last uh, review we did on a video, somebody said Uncle Harley operated the Standard Oil gas station. That was Matt Stewart. Uncle Harley did the show, and then he went to Corbin and operated the Pure and Oil one. Told that Stewart was painting over one of his signs for a second time, Sanders rushed to the scene with two Shell executives. According to Joss Ozerxes, I sorry, I can't pronounce that right, book Colonel Sanders and the American Dream, Stewart exchanged his paintbrush for a gun and finally shot Shell District Manager Robert Gibson. Sanders returned fire and wounded Stewart in the shoulder. Stewart was sentenced to 18 years in prison for the murder, but charges against Sanders were dropped after his arrest. That is true. It was self-defense. And something I later learned was Matt never got to serve his 18 years in prison because he was out on bond, and one of his employees was uh, in trouble with the law. And Stewart decided to... You know, start something with the police officer there, and the police officer fatally shot Matt Stewart, according to that article. If I could find that again, I will link it in the description. Sanders served in the military, but was an honorary colonel. That is correct. Sanders, who falsified his birth date in order to enlist in the U.S. Army in 1906, served in Cuba for several months before his honorable discharge in 1935. Governor Ruby Lafoon issued a ceremonial decree that commissioned Sanders as an honorary colonel. Accurate. After a second honorary commission in 1949, Sanders embraced the title and tried to look the part. By growing the facial hair and donning on a black frock coat and a string tie, soon after the colonel switched to a white suit, which helped him hide the flower stains and bleached his mustache and goatee to match his white hair. That's accurate. He also had a um, kind of tannish gray suit. I can't quite tell from the photo, but it wasn't black. It was a, it was a different uh, colored suit. And I have that photo featured on my Instagram. The colonel delivered babies and practiced law before hitting it big in fast food. That's accurate. Sanders had an extremely varied resume before finding success in the fried chicken business in his 60s. As a young man, he toiled as a farmhand street car conductor before working for the railroad companies across the South. Aspiring to be the next Clarence Darrow Sanders, the studied law by correspondence and practiced in justice of the peace courts in Arkansas until a courtroom brawl with a client derailed his legal career. That's true. They got into a fist fight. He operated a steamboat ferry that crossed the Ohio River between Kentucky and Indiana, and he sold life insurance and automobile tires. During his time in Corbin, Sanders even delivered babies. There was nobody else to do it, Sanders recounted in his autobiography. The husbands couldn't afford a doctor when their wives were pregnant. His first Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise was in Utah. Yeah, that was with Pete Harmon. Between Pete Harmon, Dave Thomas, and Uncle Harley, they uh, created what the classic Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket and logos and stuff that you see in the colors of the buildings that you see today. The Colonel's Fried Chicken first became a fast food hit in an unlikely location, Salt Lake City, Utah. It was there in 1952 that Pete Harmon, a... Sanders' friend, who operated one of the city's largest restaurants, became the colonel's first franchisee. Because he was denied a, a thousand and nine times. And Pete Harmon was his first yes. The Harmon restaurant pioneered the famous bucket container and used the Kentucky Fried Chicken moniker. What most people associate with worldwide fast food today looked like a regional specialty on a menu in the 1950s, Utah. Sanders was 65 and relying on a $105 a month social security check when he incorporated Kentucky Fried Chicken and began driving his 1946 Ford around the country, signing up new franchisees. And they don't add on there is that Cousin Lee was also with him, helping him do that. After selling the company, the Colonel sued Kentucky Fried Chicken for $122 million. This is true. This is when Kentucky Fried Chicken, or actually the parent company, Hugh Blaine, filed a lawsuit against the colonel for opening the colonel's lady. And uh, he countersued them for misuse of name and image and changing his recipe. Sanders sold Kentucky Fried Chicken in 64, and after food conglomerate, Hublin purchased the company. I, again, pronounced that wrong. I pronounced this word wrong. Oh, well. Sue me. 
I make fun of people for saying Colonel wrong. It's okay. You can make fun of me. Purchased the company in 1971. The cantankerous Colonel began to deride the change gravy as slop and its owners as a bunch of booze hounds. Accurate. Although still the public face of the company, Sanders so disliked Kentucky Fried Chicken food that he developed plans to franchise the Colonel's Ladies Dinner House restaurant, which he opened with his wife in Shelbyville, Kentucky, 1968, as a competitor. I haven't heard anything about him planning to franchise that restaurant. I know that he opened it in the late 60s, and he got Mary and Kate Spices to make the 99X seasoning that's used there now. And he wanted Mary and Kay to also supply KFC, but KFC denied that. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Uncle Harley even took the seasonings that were used for the dinner house and went to 200 franchisees before he died and established a connection with Mary and Kay. They had those franchisees exclusively buying the seasonings 99X from Mary and Kay until the 80s when Kentucky Fried Chicken caught on and then they filed a lawsuit and it stopped. When Hubling threatened to block the plan, Sanders sued for $122 million. The two sides settled out of court, with Sanders receiving a million dollars and a chance to give a cooking lesson to Hubling executives in return for his promise to stop criticizing KFC's food. The renamed Claudia Sanders Dinner House was allowed to remain open and still in operation. Well, what I found from my research, they sued him. They didn't threaten. They actually sued him for that, and he countersued them. And part of that agreement was that he would sell the ownership of that restaurant to someone else. And he sold it to former Kentucky Fried Chicken um, employees and family friends, the Settles family. He sold it to them and had them operate it. But he could not operate it anymore. And they don't talk about this. A, uh, in Bowling Green, a local franchise at KFC, tried to sue and Uncle Harley for making those comments. He made those comments till the day he died. Um, whenever he was at a location that wasn't doing it right, he would accuse him of changing things. And it was thrown out of court. He was sued in the late 70s. It was thrown out of court. The judge said that the founder would absolutely be able to tell whether his quality is being met or not. Sanders swore like a sailor. The colonel may have appeared as epitome of a southern gentleman, but his language was notoriously salty, particularly when he wasn't pleased with the quality of the food served up by franchisees. Colonel is famous among KFC people for the force of variety of his swearing. Reported in 1970s New Yorker profile, I used to cuss the prettiest you ever heard. Sanders admitted, I did my cussing before women or anybody else, but somehow nobody ever took offense. The colonel supposedly cursed a Japanese baseball team. No, no, he didn't curse any, he didn't like put any hexes on anybody. But I heard about this, the statue situation. Legend has it that Sanders put a hex on the Hanshin Tigers after the baseball team's joyous fan celebrated a 1985 championship by tossing a statue taken from the local KFC restaurant into a Osaka River. The team's subsequent championship drought was blamed on the curse of the colonel. But even the 2009 recovery of the statue from the Muddy River bottom has yet to result in another title for the team. That is just some kind of fun thing that they had thrown out there. He didn't put a hex on anybody, especially after he was dead. He was very religious after, um, after he was in the 70s. Uh, he, he, f he found Christ and he took religion very seriously. He said you had to get God in your heart. Just doing good things wasn't enough. To make it to heaven you had to have them in your heart so uh, pretty much accurate there's uh, some notes that I have on here that I gave uh, but pretty much accurate from the history channel and you know maybe I learned something from these this is how I do my research quite a bit I look at other articles I compare it to the notes that I have and the information that I have that I have been able to validate and verify uh, and unfortunately quite a bit over the years, people just create big fish stories. It doesn't matter what it's about when it comes to Uncle Harley. They just create big fish stories and they become legends. And you don't know what's true and what's not. It's just what gets shared around the most. And, you know, sometimes it makes sense to call it fact. But 
when it comes to my family, and we, I don't know everything, but I have access to information that, like, the History Channel don't. The History Channel doesn't have access to my cousins or my grandfather. And they could if they wanted to, but they don't. And um, we have that information that fills in the gaps of things that are under question, whether we don't know whether it's true or not. Um, so that's where my part comes in. And then I also learned things from other documentaries and stories that are put out there about Uncle Harley. I learned some information about those. I asked my family about them. If they heard about them, they can validate it for me. And if they haven't heard about it, then I have to dig in and do more research and to validate the information that I find. And if I can't validate it, then I don't talk about it because it's just not true if I can't validate it. And everything that's out there, if it's true, there's a way to prove that it's true. So, um, that's, that's this take on this one. Shorter video. Make sure you check out the other content that I have to offer. I haven't been uploading much to TikTok. I kind of quit it. I'll probably put this on TikTok. Or a version of it on TikTok. But, uh... Ah, ciao! <laughs>Howdy, folks. I'm Colonel Sanders, and you're not. I just realized on TikTok and Instagram, I have very good videos explaining the family history and my relation to Colonel Sanders and all the good stuff. How I'm the last Sanders known in the Colonel's family. Not the last one alive, but the last one in the line that's known to be the last one, if that makes sense. But I don't have that here on YouTube, really, because those are shorts, reels... TikToks, whatever you want to call it, I don't have a long-form video explaining it, so I'm going to explain to you how I'm related to Colonel Sanders and all that good happy horse stuff. First off, I'll start off by saying, on TikTok, when I first initially told people who I was and why I'm dressing this way and doing what I'm doing, people demanded a DNA test. They demanded the DNA test to prove that I'm related to Colonel Sanders. They demanded it and... They wanted a answer through DNA testing of if I was the last Sanders in the line. I refused to do that because I've already done that. Not me necessarily, but my family, like my grandpa, my father, my aunt, all of them have done DNA testing for my aunt's own genealogy research. You see, when you go on to family trees online that random people have made or even other branches of the family have made, but not knowing all the information... There is missing information, there is misinformation, and then there's accurate information. And you have to know what you're looking for. So, my aunt is the only one in the family who has done an enormous amount of genealogy work. She's the only one. And her family tree is the most accurate. However, it's not a public tree for everybody. Just people that she shares it with. And she does that because she doesn't want other people to manipulate her tree. And she doesn't want other people to see what's in there and add it to their own, not knowing whether they're actually related or not. She's very careful with making sure things are accurate in the tree. She's very careful with it. And she pays attention to the documents and everything that you do when you do ancestry work. Anyway, she made me a kinship report, which talks about um, Anthony Edward Sanders' kinship report. And this is all the Sanders in the Colonel's family, direct family line leading up to me. So we have Clarence, Charles, Ed, Anthony, who is, we call him Tony, he's my father, and me. And there's other family around there too, and I'll include some photos here. I just have to add them in, edit them in later. So anyways... I pretty much have this thing memorized. So how I'm the last Sanders in the family line is Colonel Sanders did have a son, but he died 20 years old with no children. His daughter's married and their last names changed. Therefore, their kids and their grandkids and great grandchildren all have different last names than Sanders. Colonel Sanders also had a sister, Violet Catherine Sanders. This is her. She has a lot of family around today, but none of them have the last name Sanders. And when it comes to Catherine, we call her Aunt Catherine. When it comes to Catherine, when you go on the family trees, there's a few sites where they have Violet Lou Cummings listed as the Colonel's sister and Lee Cummings' mother. 
But Violet Lou Cummings was Violet Catherine Cummings' daughter and Lee Cummings' sister and the colonel's niece. And people don't realize this because this side of the family is not talked about that much. Like, honestly, if you think about it, and I'm not meaning any disrespect to anybody, who cares about the colonel's siblings and their, their families, Right? People want to know about Colonel Sanders and his what people see and think as his direct line, which is his children and grandchildren. You don't see documentaries or other videos covering the rest of the family. But he had a sister, and his sister had two kids, and those two kids had many kids of their own who are multiplying to this day. Then he had a brother, Clarence Edward Sanders, who was my two great-grandfather. Clarence had two children. One of them was involved with KFC, the other one was not. You had James Wilbur Sanders, who was also a Kentucky colonel. He would be my great-great-uncle. Jim would be my great-great-uncle. And then his brother would be my great-grandfather, Charles Sanders. Charles had three daughters and one son. The three daughters have all family of their own today. That are, uh, they have um, grandchildren alive today. But they don't have the last name Sanders. Because they married off and the last name's changed. Charles' son, my grandpa, Ed, had two sons. And only one of his sons had children. And that would be my father, Anthony Sanders. And my father had two daughters... And one son. Now, he has stepsons, but their last names aren't Sanders. I'm his only son, biologically, with the last name Sanders. My little sister, my grandmother, my stepmother have the last name Sanders. My little sister marries and she chooses to change her last name, then that name Sanders goes. But male wise, I am the last Sanders in the family line. To carry the last name on. And that's how I'm the last Sanders in the line. Now, what about extended family? The people didn't know on TikTok that I had done a DNA, or my family has done a DNA test. Nothing has bounced back with anybody with the last name Sanders in our family tree on ancestry. Nobody. None. Period. Is it possible that there could be distant cousins of mine with the last name Sanders out there? Yes, it's possible. But it would, there would have to be extraordinary circumstances for it to be accurate. I have run into people with the last name Sanders that have all kinds of different stories of how they are related to the colonel. I have ran into them in person, and I have ran into them online. My grandfather has also ran into them in person. Every single one has been wrong. Uh, one guy says that he was the grandchild of Colonel Sanders. And that his last name is Sanders. That's inaccurate because the colonel didn't have any grandchildren with the last name Sanders. Another one insisted that their family changed their last name to Sanders to carry the family name. And that's inaccurate. They said they'd done DNA testing and it comes back. Well, no, they haven't. Because it hasn't bounced back on our records. There were some people who claimed to be Uncle Jim's child. Secret love child. That is my age. I'm 26 now, and when this person reached out, they were also 26 years old. They said they were Jim's child, and that nobody wanted, he didn't want anybody knowing about him, so it was a secret. That's a lie. Uncle Jim married twice, and he didn't have any biological children with his wives. His second wife, Pauline, he had a stepson. His stepson had a different last name. His stepson is now dead and has no kids. Uncle Jim died in 1989. I was born in 1997. I had to be to be 26 now. This person who also was 26, admitted to being 26, had to be born in 1997. Uncle Jim died in 1989. In November of 1989. So right there is a lie. People don't do their research and they think that I don't know my own family research. And not a lot of the family does know all the family research. But I do. I know a lot of it. So I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about it. My last distant cousin with the last name Sanders was Howard Sanders. He was John Alexander Sanders' son. 
I believe John Alexander Sanders had two sons. Both of them, their children, have married off the last name. Howard had daughters, and their last names changed. They married. They had kids. Those kids married, and their last names have changed. Howard died in 1997 and was the last Sanders on record distant related to me. John Alexander Sanders was Colonel Sanders' uncle. He was Wilbur or Wilbert, depending on which ancestry site you're on, who was my three great-grandfather, Wilbur Sanders, who died when Colonel Sanders was just five years old. Wilbur was on a ladder working on the farm, and he fell and he got injured, and he succumbed to a fever and died from infection when the colonel was five, just before Catherine was born. Catherine was born after her father died. But Wilbur had several siblings. One of them was John Alexander Sanders. John Alexander Sanders had kids with the last name Sanders, but circumstances have happened to where the last name has changed and there's no more Sanders on that line. All of Wilbur's siblings, their children, the last name Sanders either died off or married off. Before that, you want to go to Wilbur's father. Wilbur's father was Cyrus Sanders. Cyrus had many siblings. Cyrus's father had many siblings. And every single Sanders from that time, their children married off the last name or died with no children and the Sanders name tapered off. When it comes to the Sanders name, we could only trace it back to New Jersey in the mid-1700s with the Sanders name. There are no other records of the Sanders before then, and even then, the last name was Saunders. So at some point between the 1700s and the 1800s, our last name changed to Sanders. I don't know if this was a name change. I don't know if this was a Mary Somebody married and the name just changed from Sanders to Sa or from Saunders to Sanders. I don't know that. There's no records of it. So I might argue that there's Saunders and Sanders out there that we could be related to. Yeah, you could argue that. But unless they take a DNA test, we won't know. They won't know themselves because there's no records of them being related to us. We won't know. They won't know. Unless they do a DNA test and we get a match on an Ancestry or in any of the other websites that do ancestry work with DNA testing. It is the only way that they would know that they are related to us. It is the only way. And that, that has not happened yet. That has not popped up. So if somebody does and they want to take a test and it bounces back and you see us on your family tree because of the DNA match, so be it. Great. I'll be excited that I wouldn't be the last Sanders. But the Sanders name was Saunders in the early 1700s. So anybody that branched off from those people that aren't who we are now today that we just listed and all the family that I know that existed, their last names would be Saunders or something else. It's a very confusing thing. I had somebody come up. They knew the history, but they spelled Jaduth and Sanders wrong. And they were claiming that they were related. Their last name was Sanders. I went to my aunt. We went to the uh, genetically accurate tree. And the ancestors that they had said, and they claimed that they did tests and all this good stuff, it wasn't there. There was no match. And the person that they said that they were offspring of, or ancestors of, Jaduth and Sanders... There were two Jaduth and Sanders, and none of their children matched the names, or their grandchildren matched the names that were given to us. Their last name died off and married off. There is an Enoch Sanders. The names get weirder the further back you go. There's a Leo Sanders. There, there were all kinds of Sanders in my ancestral tree. But the circumstances to where we get to now, the Sanders name married and died off. It got to a point where there was 
Harlan Sanders, Clarence Sanders, and Howard Sanders. Uncle Harley had a son with the last name Sanders. He didn't have any kids of his own, unfortunately. And the Sanders name died off with Harlan David Sanders Jr. Clarence Sanders had two sons and one of them successfully had a kid that had the last name Sanders to carry it on. They had a kid and here I am. Howard had daughters. And their last names changed. They chose to change them when they married. Now, the only way... Now, we already discussed how the DNA thing would work. The only way that anybody related to the colonel would have the last name Sanders not from Clarence's side would be if one of my cousins chooses to change their last name to Sanders. And that's okay if they want to do that. That's their choice to do that. But that's the only other way. We get people that approach us that claim to be the colonel's grandchildren with the last name Sanders. They claim to be related to the colonel's brother as with the last name Sanders. And especially when it comes to Clarence Sanders, my great-great-grandfather, I know every single Sanders that have existed from him down to me. Every single one. Boy, girl, whatever they identify as. Every single one, I know them. I know of them. I know them. I know of their history because I didn't get to meet my great-grandpa Charles. He died a few years before I was born, but I know of him. Uncle Jim died in 1989, but I know of him. So when people, people go online and they talk within their communities and brag about this stuff, and nobody knows any better. Nobody knows any better, so they believe them. But now here I am, and I'm not trying to be mean about it. I'm not trying to be boastful or hateful. But what I do online, I make sure that I have my information as accurate as possible. I share the history that I can share. I set records straight on things when people have things wrong. And that includes somebody pretending to be related who is not related and me calling them out for it. Now, I, some people add the kernel to their tree from hints on ancestry. They do. They have somebody in their family that has a similar name to one of the ancestors of Colonel Sanders. So they just add them to the tree. Some people make honest mistakes like that. It is possible. It's entirely possible to make a family tree completely made of hints that you don't know whether it's accurate or not that you're related to them. That is entirely possible. And people make an honest mistake of just adding him to the tree and they think it's cool and they share it. Those type of people, when I first initially interact with them, I'm nice about it. And I have a conversation with them on how they are wrong. But if they're right, they need to show me this, this, and this. And if they can't, then they're not related to me. And then I get people who get hateful with me because they don't like being told that they're wrong. Those people I do get a little snippy with. But what I do online is to make sure that I set the record straight on things. And for years, people have pretended to be related to him. For years, people have spread mis misinformation about him and this family. And I am just here now to you know, address all of that. People try to discredit me by going online to family trees, even grave family trees. They don't have all the family related to the colonel that lived, died, and exist today. And they pull those trees up and they're like, hey, right here, you're not related because you're not listed here. Well, I'm not on any of the public trees. My fame is just now starting. It hasn't, it, it's not a thing that I have own Wikipedia page. The only Wikipedia page I have is the sample one I was editing and making years ago. Somebody hasn't made a Wikipedia page about me. I am not in any of the history books. The only people that are in these family trees are super close related to the colonel names that they have heard so they add it to the tree and the colonel himself you will not find a public tree that accurately shows me my sisters my grandfather his father his brother some of them will some of them won't you will not find a tree that shows all the colonel's grandchildren you will not find a tree that shows all the colonel's sisters grandchildren because not all the family wants to be online. Not all the family wants the attention of it. Not all the family wants to acknowledge their relation. Not all the family wants their business out there. And we have to respect that ourselves. So you can't just do a simple Google search 
and find everybody related to the family and say, no, you're not related because you're not on the Google search. That's not what I do. I actually have the kinship report. I have the family photos. I have the family and we know our information. I don't do a simple Google search and say, no, you're not related. This entire video is 20 minutes long so as of me recording right now, explains to you how I know what I know. It explains to you how I'm the last Sanders. So I mean, if somebody genuinely doesn't know if they're related to me or the Colonel, I will help them the best that I can with the information I have. That's how John Alexander's family exists today. They all have different last names. I know them now. You have the last name of Place and Curtis. They weren't entirely sure how they were related. They knew that Howard Sanders was their uh, grandfather. They knew that. But they didn't know how Howard was related. But they did have photos that match photos that I have. They just didn't know who they were. But guess what? Because of our ancestry research that we have done as a family, and because of our photos that we have with the names written on the backs of them, we were able to identify their family member, John Alexander Sanders, and connect the family. We were able to do that for them. I will believe anybody, and I, I won't dig into it, um, I won't go deep into it unless your last name is Sanders, but I will believe anybody that says they're related to me that has a different last name because we have a lot of cousins. Although the Sanders cannot be traced past the 19th or the, past the 1700s, we have other family such as the Colonel's maternal side. My three great grandmother, Margaret Sanders, who was Margaret Dunleavy. Margaret Dunleavy comes from the Cleggs and many other last names that can be traced way far back. The Dunleavy's is a huge family. They were a huge family. And there are a lot of them and a lot of ancestors and distant cousins and direct relatives of the Dunleavy's around the world today. Clarence's wife, Bertha Cathcart, who had Charles and James Sanders. She has a lot of family, a lot of cousins. And there, there's a lot of family. We have Cath, Cathcart, we have Jones, we have Smiths, we have Fords, we have Jets, we have Dunleavy's, we have Hans, we have Combs, we have Barker, we have Northcutt, we have Stacy, and many, 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 many other last names with uh, a lot of extended family. A lot. I mean, if you jump into this rabbit hole with me, of all the people, you're going to start questioning who you might be dating or married to because of how many people we're related to. But when it comes to the last name Sanders, yes, there's a lot in the world. No, there's not a lot related to the Colonel left today. The ones left today, me, my grandpa, my uncle, my father, those four. And then you have my sister, you have my grandmother, and you have my stepmother. Seven total. And that's it. There's other people related to the Sanders that you could say is part of the Sanders family, yes. But that's it. And like the story with Joe Lettington, he never said that he was the step-nephew of the Colonel. He said he was the nephew. He's not related. He's related to Claudia Price, his second wife. He's his step-nephew. But people coined him as the nephew, which discredited me and anyone else who are actually nephews that wanted to say anything or share anything. You know how many people have come up to me and said, you're not Joe Lettington. Joe Lettington is the nephew of the Colonel. You're not Joe Lettington. Because a lot of news sources said the only nephew, the Colonel's own nephew. No. No. Let's get it straight. The Colonel had a brother and a sister who had children. None of their last names were Lettington. Not even today. Joe Lennington is not in this family. We do not claim him. But there's people like him who put out false stories, such as a fake recipe and a false story behind it or exaggerated story for clout and attention. You notice none of the Colonel's blood-related family have actually come out, started bragging about being related, talking about this and that. I mean, James Sanders was the last one. He actually was the brand ambassador for KFC, too. 
He was the last blood related Sanders. I was super proud of the relation to actually show off. Lee Cummings was as well. They were born around the same time. James was 1917. Lee was in the 1920s. Lee went on to start Famous Recipe and his own legacy with fried chicken and that side of the family. So between those two, they talked about it. But when they died, it wasn't really talked about much. You didn't see us in the news. You didn't see us on TV. You didn't see us writing books. You didn't see us doing anything with the brand. It just kind of went away. And here I am, I'm popping up, and I, I just got tired of seeing things. Like, I became a Kentucky colonel for my work at a food pantry. I didn't know I could be a colonel. I became a colonel. I became Colonel Sanders. KFC ads were disrespecting Uncle Harley, and people weren't realizing he was a real person or that he had family, so I started talking. Here we are today, and I'm a historian for the brand. And my family. And ever since I started doing this stuff, and I, I'm proud of my relation... And after KFC made up with me, I am full, you know, merchandise, full talk about this, full uh, their food. You know, like I'm proud to be related to the brand now. And there's some mistakes that they make still, yes, but I'm proud to be related to them, seeing how they're working. They're welcoming me into groups. I can see how the franchisees work. Like, this is a whole new thing for me, and I love it. And because of the stuff that the battle that I fought to get to this point to where KFC and I could sit down and talk, which we did in April, and to set the record straight on these rumors, set the record straight on people lying, the rest of the family that initially didn't want anything to do with it, not all of the family, but some of the family, that didn't want anything to do with it, they left it in the past, are getting excited with me and sharing their photos and stories with me to share with you guys. It's bringing family together. And although not all the families are together, I don't think Joe Langton's ever going to want to be family, even though he's a step uh, cousin of mine. Maybe not all the family would want to, but maybe in the future, more of them will warm up to talking about their relation and connecting family through it and talking with the brand, you know, just keeping the Colonel's legacy, what he stood for, what he had, what he created alive through the family even if we're not doing it officially with the brand just to stop all this bull crap going around there's a lot of bull crap going around so anyways to sum up this entire video i'm the last sanders in the family line unless somebody does a dna test and i have a distant cousin hiding out there that would be great colonel sanders brother is my two great grandfather Colonel Sanders is my three great uncle. Colonel Sanders' brother is the only one who has family today with the last name Sanders. We're a direct line from the Colonel's brother. <laughs> Howdy folks, I'm Colonel Sanders and you're not. It's 2024, Happy New Year to everybody who is watching this. If you're still on my channel, thank you. If you're coming from Instagram, TikTok, thank you. And... Before I get started, the image behind me is an AI-generated image as if KFC and Fortnite do a collab where they put Uncle Harley in the video game as a character and have a finger-licking season at some point during Fortnite's life. So, with that said, KFC, we all want to see it. You got me back on your team now. I want to see it. Let's make it happen. Contact Fortnite. It shouldn't be too hard. I know Nick Chavez wanted to see it. He liked the idea. I saw that. Now, with that said, I'm not sure how much of this I can show you. Uh, most people know that back in April, I made up with Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I've been learning more about the business more than I knew before through the research and the family history that I have with Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now I'm learning about the current days and how the business operates. When Uncle Harley first started Kentucky Fried Chicken, there were no contracts. There was nothing that was a legal binding document with any of his franchisees in the beginning. He can be quoted saying that it was the finest group of men and women that got together to do business. And it was all done on a handshake. His first yes for his franchising was Pete Harmon in Salt Lake City, Utah. And that restaurant's still there today. The world's very first Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise. And it was on a handshake that Uncle Harley would get a nickel for every whole chicken sold in a meal. And that handshake is what sparked many more handshakes after that. Uncle Harley did the same deal with many, many, many other franchisees 
who saw his success in Salt Lake City, Utah and Corbin, Kentucky, and decided to take it on as a project of their own. It wasn't until about when Brown and Massey purchased KFC in 1964 that all the legal uh, documents and no longer relying on handshakes started taking place. Everything was done through the system rather than in a gentleman's agreement. So we can agree that Uncle Harley did not like that. Many people that knew him knew that he had an issue with this, and many people that knew him also knew he really, really, really disliked lawyers because of this. And the other reason why he disliked lawyers is because he used to be one, and he failed at that because he got into a brawl in the courtroom. Anyways, so I reached out to one of the franchisees that I knew that helped make up with Kentucky Fried Chicken and myself, and I asked them just to humor me what goes into starting a franchise. They told me that first I need to get approved or pre-approved to qualify to be a franchisee. It's about a $750,000. You have to at least have to have that in your pocket pretty much or your bank to qualify. So obviously I'm not going to qualify because regardless what people say, my family is not rich just because we're related to Colonel Sanders. That's just not how it works. Anyway, so you have to have that. And this new agreement, and I only show you this beginning part that's in front of my face here. The franchisee will operate a dine-in and carry-out KFC outlet, which prepares and sells chicken and other menu items KFC LLC approves. The total investment necessary to begin operation of a newly constructed Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet ranges from... $1,852,825 to $3,771,550. This includes a $45,575 to $50,500 that must be paid to KFC LLC or its affiliates. The total investment necessary to begin operation of the reopened or remodeled former KFC outlet or converted KFC outlet ranges from $1,000,000 $52,825 to $2,521,550. This includes $45,000 or $45,575 to $50,500 that must be paid to KFC LOC or its affiliates. Many can agree that Uncle Harley would not like this, including the people that work for KFC that knew him. Because we all loan for the day, long for the day, that... We could rely on each other's handshake and word to be their vows. I only show you that bit of it because that is the disclosure agreement for franchisees to get started. It's about a 400-page document, and I don't know if I can show that to you all, but I will show you that because everybody's always asking me, what does it cost? What does it cost to start a franchise? Because when I was doing things with Lee's, I actually learned what it costs to start a franchise. It was significantly less because they're not as big as a chain. But... I was able to get that from the company itself before we went our separate ways. And I was able to, and I was allowed to share that with folks because obviously Lee's wanted me to f do free advertisement to get uh, franchisees to franchise with them. With that said, KFC right now is pushing for more outlets to be open. There's over 20,000 locations worldwide, 1% is corporate owned, 99% is franchisee owned. And the franchisees can be companies, they can be individuals, they can be a group of investors, it could be whatever, but it's not the corporation. The corporation only regulates what the approved menu items and the way of conducting business is done in those franchises. Anyways, let's get back to the franchising. Everybody's always asking me how much it cost for KFC, since I talked about Lee's for so long last year. How much does it cost for KFC? Well, it's about $750,000 you are required to have in the bank to qualify as a franchisee to get the application. After that, the most it costs is about $3 million to build a brand new location, and that includes buying the property to build the franchise on. And it's also important for me to know, I don't speak for the brand, I don't work for the brand, I'm friends with some of the people in the brand, but I'm not an employee of the brand, I'm just a historian on my family history, and I'm learning more about the brand and how it operates today than I ever did before, and I'm sharing that with you. So again, I don't know how much more I could say about that document, or if I could show the full thing, and if I can, I will get permission and I'll share the full thing. But until then, that's the only bit I'm showing you because that is the question everybody asks. And furthermore, down on there, it says that is that 
number can change and is subject to change even without notice. So that can change from the moment you're watching this video in 2024. That's how much it costs though, roughly. You're gonna need a few million dollars to you want to invest. You could also lease the, um, get a leasing permit or whatever it's called. I'm not entirely sure, I was just reading it. I'm not an expert in this field of franchising today. I knew how Uncle Harley did it. I didn't know how they do it today. Uh, you, you can lease it and it's significantly less, but you still need to have some pretty good wealth to invest in the franchise. But KFC right now is encouraging expansion. So there y'all go. Catch me in the next video. We do a lot of KFC history, lore, family lore. I talk about rumors and stuff. I got more knowledge about fried chicken than anybody else in the country probably has. I know more about Uncle Harlan than most of my family now since I took all my family stories and put them together in my head and I'm able to share those with y'all. Um, we also do a lot of gaming on YouTube, so make sure you check that out too. We got a lot of stuff, a lot of content, a lot of stuff over the last 10 years on YouTube, a lot of content on Instagram, a lot of content on TikTok. And those are the short form videos of this information that you're getting in long form here on YouTube. So thank you. Goodbye.